All right, I think it's time. <laughs> um, we'll go ahead and get started so that uh, we don't take up, take up too much time from our speakers today. Um, so welcome back everyone to Living Light session two. This is 2A, so we'll hear quite a bit about visual ecology today, which is quite exciting. Um, at the very end of the session, there's going to be some closing remarks and some prizes given out. So when we're done, if you could just please head back to the main room so we can wrap everything up. Um, there'll just be a couple of minutes of you know, things to say, and then the prizes will be handed out. Um, and with that, otherwise, like you all know the drill now, um, please, keep your, please keep your microphones muted unless you're the one speaking. Put your questions in the chat and enjoy. I'm going to give a one minute um, warning when you're almost up with your time. Um, and otherwise, with that, thank you very much for coming. And our first speaker today is going to be Judy Chingwang Wong. Judy, if you want to just share your screen. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Good um, evening. Um, today, I'm just uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, the spectrum polarization processing in the stomach and fault visual system. So a brief introduction of myself. I'm a third year PhD student in um, University of Queensland, and I'm working with uh, Professor Justin Marshall on the visual system of stomach fault. And today I'm going to be sharing with you of some uh, results that I got so far from my PhD. Okay, so first of all, let's go through what are we gonna um, see today. So basically I'll go through the visual system of the method and then I'll introduce the two of my methods. One is intracellular recordings of the stomatopod lamina, which um, we try to record the lamina processing cells to see their response to different stimulus. And um, the second part will be a quick um, overview of the behavioral experiments that I just done on Lizard Island like a month ago. And then at the end, well, I'll give a brief conclusion of what, I, what we know so far. Okay, so to start with, the visual system of stomatopod as seen, uh, are, is seen as one of the most complex visual systems. So as you can see from their um, eye, eye a compound eye here, there's a bit in the middle called mid-band. If we um, take a closer look, you could see it's actually a very complex structure. It has um, a dorsal and ventral hemispheres and a mid-band in the middle. And these dorsal and ventral part hemisphere parts are just like um, usual um, compound eyes as those in other crustaceans. Hello. So, hello. Um. Hello. Keep going, Judy. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go for it. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. And we, if we look into the mid band part, which is the very unique structure that only um, that is specialized that in their compound eye, could see the row. Uh, there are six rows enlarged omatidia in this mid band region, where row one and row four is in, uh, in charge with in um, spectral processing, where row five and six are in charge of circular polari um, polarization reception. So their row five and row six could see circular polarized light. And um, just like I have mentioned before, um, for row one and row six, it has 12, up to 12 um, narrow spectral sensitivity uh, photoreceptors that has um, 12 narrow spectral sensitivities that could perceive colors in 12 channels, which is um, pretty complex. And um, if we want to look at um, their processing system. Actually, we don't know too much about their processing, but in terms of behaviors, there were um, several um, studies have done in terms of um, how they how they use the different, um, how they use circular polarized light and their color vision. So start with the circular polarization. Um, it, um, in this study, 
um, a few years ago, it has been shown that they use the pro circular polarization from um, the reflection from their cuticle to use, use it as a communication signal. And um, how about their, but then how about their processing, path, processing systems? We still don't know, but um, because the, from their structure, from their nanopole structure, it looks like the CPO vision system is very similar to the linear polarization system, which is similar to other um, species like crabs and other crustaceans. So in other crustaceans, um, it is very common to, uh, for their visual systems to use um, uh, opponency processing for processing um, linear polarization signals. Um, so it is, it is hypothesized that for CPO vision, they might as well use the opponency processing, but we still don't know in the um, electrophysiology um, level. And as for the color vision, um, for human, we have three types of cone, um, cone cells that could perceive color. And um, so for this visual system, we use the uh, opponency processing, which is uh, used um, compared to each two of the photoreceptors, kind of photoreceptors, and then um, integrate the information and perceive the color. For, for Medbot, um, they have 12 color, 12 kinds of color photoreceptors. So that would be, um, that would be very difficult and complex for them to process it with um, conventional opponent processing as it has been found in other animals. So, but um, we think that, we thought that they must have a very accurate, very um, executive um, color resolution until in um, 2014, Zone has done a sexual uh, color discrimination behavioral test. And then it found out that with the modeling data, if we use 12 kinds of photoreceptors and put it in the model for potency processing, it might, it will definitely have a very sharp, um, very high spectral resolution. However, um, from her behavioral experiment, it shows that they actually have a very coarse um, spectral sensitivity, um, spectral resolution. So that means they must have a different um, type of spectral processing system, which um, in turn, there are two hypotheses. One is spinning color system, which they basically use like a barcode system just to identify the pattern instead of comparing the colors. And the other system is based on their um, anatomical, anatomical structure, which is they have two layers of photoreceptors in these four rows, so they might have a multi-dichromatic color potency. So for the intracellular recordings, I use a um, uh, sharp electro, and then we um, use this rotating polarizer with a hole in the middle, so we could give um, either eyes or a whole animal with different stimulus. And then, so the results show that for non, um, for the intracellular recordings, now I have recorded um, several types of neurons. This neuron is a non-opponent CPL neuron that has um, non-opponent a response to different types of um, linear um, and circular polarized light. And the red arrow just shows the um, different extent of their inhibited um, um, response. Um, and then let's go on to the opponent processing um, neuron. This one is a um, CPL Opponency, proce uh, opponency processing neuron, where I gave, when I gave this neuron um, different handness of circular polarized light, it actually showed opponent uh, characteristics. And when I stand this neuron, it actually showed the um, recording location is exactly at the row five and six lamina cartridges, which is consistent with the result. So, and this is, very impressive because this is uh, one of the most, um, one of the first electrophysiology evidence for um, circular polarization processing. And if we look at the spectral processing um, neurons, 
we see non-opponent processing neurons. Of course, this neuron, it re, um, reacts to um, different spectrum with all hyperpolarized um, response. And we also recorded neurons that has um, slightly opponent processing characteristics. And um, surprisingly, because I'm recording, I'm targeting at the lamina cartridge. So sometimes I will record the photoreceptor terminals. And from the data of the photoreceptor terminals, I also found some characteristics of um, spectral opponency, which support the previous science findings from the spectral opponent um, LMC. And it seems like this um, uh, photoreceptor terminal um, opponency would end up giving a narrower spectral sensitivity of the terminal site than the um, actual um, photoreceptor cell body site. And so a brief um, conclusion from the first part of the experiment, electrophysiology part, it, said, it showed that the circular polarization, it used opponency processing and SEM as the spectral processing. However, because uh, um, there are not many replications for the, uh, for the spectral processing data. So um, I move on to, uh, I have another set of um, experiments, which is behavioral experiments for um, specifically to examine the opponent processing of the, um, their, their color processing. And so for the behavioral part, um, basically, um, remember I mentioned before the, these two hypotheses, um, which is one is the binning and the other is the multi-dichromatic opponency. We wanted to further test the possibility of um, multi-dichromatic multi color opponency by narrowing down the activation of the photoreceptors. So for example, if we only let um, one row of photoreceptors um, is functional for um, color discrimination, will they still be able to discriminate color? So. Um, uh, this is an example of my the ex experiment design, which we cover. Uh, we, co we cover a filter, a red filter, on top of the behavioral tank, and then let them discriminate color, red color from gray, which means there will be only two photoreceptors that will be um, able to involve with this discrimination. And um, so, one in, more minute, Judy. It, okay. If it's a human um, um, photoreceptor um, visual system, we will, wouldn't be able to see the red color very clearly um, on the red filter. But um, for stomatic part, if you cover the red filter, it turns out that actually they still have quite um, good performance on discriminating colors in this narrow um, mm, wave, wavelength range. Um, so, this is just a brief um, preliminary data from my previous um, field trip. So I use natural line single layer tent to see their um, behavioral differences. So this bar, um, these two show the natural light green behavior in the natural light, and this is in the tent. Um, this one is the natural light for discriminating red cable ties, and this one is the under the tent. So it shows that um, whether or not they are um, discriminating color from natural light or tent, they still have pretty good discrimination ability. And same as when I put um, double tent and 0 0.9 and these filters. So um, oh, yeah, overall, it just um, told us that um, both electrophysiology and behavioral data basically just support spectral opponency for, uh, for their visual processing. And um, they also use um, opponency processing for circular polarization systems um, information. Yeah. Great. So that's about it. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Judy. Anyone can put your questions in the chat um, if you have questions for Judy. Um, otherwise, Anarud Chakraborty, I believe you are up next if you want to just share your screen. Okay, hello, uh, my name is uh, John Kirwan. I'm a postdoc at Stazione Logica Anton Dorn in uh, Naples, Italy, where I'm working on uh, understanding uh, vision in the kinoderm, the uh, uh, sea urchin, uh, as you will see now. Title of my talk is Spine and Sight, 
the CH and Paris and Trotis Limitus can see. Uh, so first of all, thank you all for coming. Those of you who have arrived uh, who are very late at night or very early in the morning, as the case may be, uh, thank you for taking the time to, uh, to see my talk. And thanks to everybody involved in this, uh, uh, in our project. So this is a, a Human Frontier Science Programme for the project. And uh, thanks to our collaborators in uh, here in Naples and also in Lund, Sweden, um, Germany, and Stony Brook, New York. So uh, sea urchins lack eyes. This is not the case in all echinoderms. They're close relatives, the sea stars, uh, in fact, have eyes on the end of their legs. Um, but sea urchins uh, lack eyes. And yet some species can see. So this is a case of a, a very interesting phenomenon called a, a monocular vision, uh, which is increasingly the focus of, of study. Uh, so exactly how they, they can see remains an enigma. Um, and it's a, a, a subject of uh, ongoing research by several groups. Um, you can see here this uh, a bright blue feature here, the ambulacrum. Um, uh, so one theory posits that um, uh, vision is achieved uh, using cells here, uh, whereas others believe that it's uh, related to the surface features um, of the parts of the animal. Uh, so uh, we here in Naples are, are very interested in this, uh, this system, how it works, um, uh, down to the uh, uh, physiology and anatomy. Um, uh, and we've been concerned ourselves with a single species. So the edible sea urchin, Parasentrotus uh, lividus, um, which is uh, much desired in the gastronomy here in the Mediterranean region. Um, so this species most certainly um, can de detect light, but uh, can it in fact see? Uh, spoiler alert, uh, yes. Um, I'd like to thank Anna Rood for um, introducing the, the concept of, of photoreception um, aside from actual vision. So what do I mean uh, that it can see? Uh, so you see here uh, individuals are uh, are sheltering below rocks, and uh, but this can be achieved with simple shadow detection or circadian and other endogenous rhythms. Um, don't require actual uh, vision, just the detection of light. Um, actual vision means representation or the perception of an, an image, so uh, uh, not just a broad stroke changes in the distribution of light across the body. But I'm talking about very, very, very coarse vision, so this is not uh, human vision or bird vision. You're talking about uh, less than a cycle per degree. So um, to test this, uh, we've carried out uh, behavioral experiments uh, using these individuals. Uh, we've have an, an arena uh, as so in the figure here. Um, so a, a very a large arena, which is filled with water, of course, taking animals from the Gulf of Naples nearby, place them in the center of the arena, put it under bright light. These animals are mostly night active, so equivalent to, uh, to daylight, and uh, uh, place the animal on top of an obstacle. And watch as the animal has moved in relation to its environment. We've tried to keep keep other um, non-visual cues constant. And then on the, the walls of the arena, we placed in, in one location a visual stimulus to see if animals would, uh, would move towards this stimulus or if they would move randomly in their environment. And this is relevant because uh, these animals will uh, say she seek shelter, which may be to do with approaching a dark area or maybe to looking for structure in the, uh, the environment and frequently move towards uh, a dark region. So represented here by this black bar. Uh, we were interested in what kind of stimuli would be uh, appropriate for this kind of experiment and a, a wide different variety of stimuli were used. So we looked at different kind of wavelet functions, which could be uh, useful for us. And we, we settled upon this first Hermitian wavelet, which is simply the uh, first derivative of a Gaussian uh, to use. As you can see, it comprises a, a black and white region, uh, which when averaged over are the same gray as the background. So an animal with the no resolution or, or, or insufficient resolution will not be able to see this target and not be able to move towards it if it so wishes. Okay, uh, you should be seeing a, a moving GIF here, but uh, I believe you don't, so you have to use your imagination. Uh, this is uh, one trial here, an animal positioned in the center of the arena. Um, in this instance, it moved along this path here. If you see this uh, uh, orange path here, was that taken by the animal? Um, to derive a heading from this, so to say, uh, where the animal moved in relation to the stimulus. We mark these uh, uh, two circles that you see here, the black and, um, and the blue, and uh, uh, found the vector um, taken by the animal uh, when it crossed these two circles and uh, uh, normalized this vector in relation to the stimulus uh, to, to say where the animal moved in relation to the stimulus. So this here was with a, uh, a stimulus of 30 degrees in width. So we didn't do, uh, just do this for, uh, for one size of stimulus, used a whole array of different uh, size stimuli, starting with uh, 
negative control of uh, zero degrees and uh, wider and wider of these uh, first emission wavelength stimuli. Uh, one um, ludicrously large 150 degree stimulus here shown on the, the bottom right. So in each of uh, these plots, I've shown uh, the, the path taken by an animal and the, the heading derived uh, from that path. And again, the stimulus here is uh, shown at the very, very top. So uh, what did we find? Um, Paracentrosis lividus uh, did not respond to the, to the smaller stimuli. Uh, so there were 50 trials taken, so the same individuals in, in each different level of the of stimulus size. And you can see here that uh, with the zero degrees, 15 degrees, and, and 30 degree um, uh, stimuli, uh, there was uh, little no response uh, from the animal. These were not significant according to V-tests. Uh, this black arrow here at the center uh, represents the uh, circular, uh, the mean circular direction and also the mean resultant length. A longer arrow means animals are, are more directed. A shorter arrow means they're undirected. We did, however, find that they responded to, uh, uh, to, to larger stimuli. So here you can see more animals are approaching uh, the, uh, this uh, target than otherwise. Um, they, in the case of the 45 and 60 degree stimuli, they appear to be uh, approaching the uh, center of the stimulus, whereas with the 150 degree stimulus, they appear to be approaching more the, uh, the black bar rather than the area of, of highest contrast. Uh, and these were all significant according to, uh, to V-tests. So here we have for comparison, um, all six of these treatments together. Animals, by the way, um, only responded when they were positioned atop a, an obstacle at the beginning, uh, with the uh, trials were used where there was no stimulus at the start, uh, animals did not respond. So they needed this to instigate their, their orientation to visual stimuli. Okay, um, but to actually derive a uh, value resolution from this, uh, we would like to uh, use a psychometric model at going psychometric function. And uh, we've been doing this using uh, non linear Bayesian estimation using the STAN language uh, accessed VR. Um, and the idea here is because the uh, the lapse rate of the animal is, is quite high. You noticed in many cases they weren't approaching the stimulus, although they uh, preferentially were. Uh, that uh, you can uh, model this by introducing this uh, gamma here, this, uh, this lapse rate, uh, to, to get a, a more accurate measure of the, the threshold, which you derive from this uh, inflection point. So, uh, so far, this is what we have uh, we've done. We have uh, estimated the resolution threshold at 52 degrees, although it's admittedly a uh, very wide um, credible interval, 95% credible interval shown here, 45.99 degrees. Um, the, I should point out, yes, the, uh, this was uh, using a digital regression function. To do this, we had to discretize the data. So we took the uh, one fifth sector of the circle, which was uh, closest to the stimulus or around the stimulus, and animals which, uh, whose headings fell into this uh, sector, uh, we, we regarded as successes, and those which fell uh, without we regarded uh, as failures. This is how we um, dichotomize the data. Okay, so I can conclude that um, Paracentosis lividus uh, certainly has vision, but very, very coarse vision. In fact, it's dismally bad uh, in comparison to, uh, uh, to a bird or, or a mammal, for instance. Um, best estimate of resolution we have is uh, 52 degrees. We'd like to improve upon this with the addition of um, more types of stimuli and also the inclusion of uh, random effects of, of individual. So, but uh, regardless, this, uh, uh, this level of really, really dismal resolution is capable of tasks such as a shelter seeking, uh, possibly finding um, uh, the most structured in the environment or simply finding dark spaces, uh, but not timely social behavior with animals of its own size in any reasonable time frame. Okay, um, thank you very much, and I'll take any questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think there was one question in the chat, which we can do really quickly before we move on. Um, Nico says, wouldn't a black and white target represent a conflicting stimulus for approach, dark or escape light? Could this explain the weak response for narrow stimuli? So this is, uh, 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 I, it's, it's not something we've seen, the animals um, evading the, uh, the white bar on that scale. So when I've used different kinds of stimuli, this, this is not uh, something we've clearly seen. Um, and using uh, other just dark targets, you, you don't find that there is uh, um, 
an incredibly weak response or a, a much, much, much stronger response with this species. It's very hard to get, for instance, over 50% success with these kinds of stimuli with this species. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think next up we have Gregor speaking on behalf of Marco. Um, so if you could just share your screen. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yep, we can see you and hear you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm talking on behalf of uh, Marco Ilic, who cannot uh, attend this session, unfortunately. I'll try to quickly convince you that uh, nymphalid butterflies, um, as opposed to present beliefs, uh, have red receptors. Uh, and uh, uh, this is not an exclusive uh, property of some species, but um, quite widespread. Uh, these receptors are created by optical tearing. So, um, um, color vision in diurnal butterflies is based on the ancestral trichromatic scheme, which is uh, very often expanded with uh, multiple options, uh, leading to through color vision um, in the UV blue green range and often expanded into the red range. And um, that can be tested uh, beautifully with uh, many methods, including behavior, uh, which has been most uh, accurately done in uh, Papilio. So, nymphalid or brushwood butterflies. Uh, have notoriously proven to be difficult to show uh, red receptors. So uh, every recording session so far has yielded uh, three receptors, uh, UV blue and green, uh, ranging from Parantica Danaus to Polygonia, Sasakia, etc. But behavioral evidence uh, suggests that uh, some of species uh, are able to distinguish reds from oranges, such as uh, the monarch and Filiconius. Uh, so this suggests that they do have uh, red receptors and uh, uh, possibly tetrachromacy, so extended color vision to the red range. Therefore, we decided to screen across uh, six subfamilies of nymphalid butterflies and impale uh, the receptors of 10 species, uh, including the iconic uh, monarchs and morphos and uh, fritillaries, etc. Uh, all these beauties that you can see here. Prima. So for that, we used uh, fast spectral stimulation with the uh, diffraction grating uh, combined LEDs, which allowed us to um, get the information of the spectral sensitivity within uh, one second uh, of a photoreceptor. And uh, what this machine does is it uh, gets uh, LEDs ordered so that they can deliver isoquantal stimulation with narrow bandwidth uh, pulses uh, in a very short time. So by doing this, uh, we got uh, recordings such as this uh, from uh, the Apatura ilia, green, UV, and blue receptors, uh, which are uh, not as boring as uh, suspected because they do have an uh, opponent uh, signal in the green range, which is a result of uh, the proven fact that uh, the insects uh, do have direct interfoot receptor opponent using histamine-gated chloride channels, uh, such as the case in all insects probably, uh, but also uh, in vertebrates, according to the latest work in zebrafish. So a novel spectral class that we immediately found in Arginis Paphia was um, the spectral class that was uh, not so boring as uh, the uh, UV blue green receptors so far, but the one that responded to green pulses with depolarization and hyperpolarization to red pulses. So the question was whether this uh, hyperpolarization was just an extracellular artifact so far, it has been discarded like as such, or true synaptic interaction. To test this, we uh, injected current into the uh, measured cell. So when we injected positive current, it depolarized the cell and decreased depolarizing responses in the green and increased hyperpolarizing responses in red. The opposite negative current hyperpolarized the cell and it increased depolarizing responses in the green and more importantly, even reversed hyperpolarizing responses in the red part of the spectrum, which shows us that uh, the reversal occurred um, at about the reversal or equilibrium potential for chloride uh, anions, uh, which suggests that this is a true synaptic current through histaminergic synapses. The cellular identity of the two units that form this opponent pair um, was uh, then analyzed using selective chromatic adaptation. So when we shone red light, monochrome red light on the cell and stimulated with a spectral sequence, this led to a hyperpolarization of the cell and it silenced the red opponent unit and isolated the green unit. The opposite could be done with uh, selective adaptation with green light. This depolarized the cell and silenced the green unit and isolated the red unit. So then we could uh, uh, record the spectral sensitivity of both units 
in larger butterflies, which had uh, bigger cells that lasted for hours with the monochromator, so that we got precise spectral sen uh, sensitivity of the red unit, which has a sharp peak, uh, peaking at around 620, 610 nanometers. So this is a true red receptor. The species that have this red receptor uh, are are genies, Prepona, two-tailed Pasha, Monarch, Heliconius, uh, Miliatea, the Morpho, and uh, another Fritillorius pieria. This was found in all these species, but not in Apatura or Vanessa. The telltale sign of the presence of the red receptor is the mosaic eye shine, uh, the reflection from the compound eye, which has red reflecting omatidia. Apatura and Vanessa have a non-mosaic eye shine, which reflects either green or yellowish, but do, they don't have the red reflecting omatidia. This is perfectly in line with the findings by Adriana Brisco and Zaccardi, who tested the behavioral paradigm in Heliconius and Vanessa, and both butterflies were perfectly able to tell red from blue, but uh, only Heliconius was able to tell uh, red from orange or red from red. This is in line with our findings where we found this unit for Heliconius 615. We injected intracellular dye to get the cellular identity of the green plus red minus cell, which turned out to be R1 or R2. These are the long visual fibers in butterflies that usually express UV or blue opsin and are directly involved in the color processing. And this is again in line with the unpublished findings of Adriana Briscoe and McCullough. Um, where it has been shown that heliconius, in addition to UV and blue opsin, expresses also green opsin in R1 or 2. This leads to six material types. And they even express uh, blue and green opsin, again, as we have found uh, that this green cell is actually picking in the blue in heliconius. The cellular identity of red unit was more difficult to prove because we have never been able to directly record from the red unit, which means that it's an inaccessible cell, a small cell, most likely the basal R9 cell, which is uh, confirmed by the small dynamic range of this unit. So if you measure the voltage intensity response, you see that the red unit uh, responds to only a two log range and the green unit responds to four log range. R9 is indeed a small basal cell occupying only the proximal 12 microns or so. Uh, its optical path is essentially doubled because it sits on top of the tapetal mirror. So uh, this helps a bit, but still it's a very small cell, which has also different properties, such as slow phototransduction, because we systematically measured the synaptic delay, and it turned out to be exceptionally long for the red response, because uh, the synapse itself takes only about a millisecond, as can be seen in the blue-green or UV-green uh, latency. But here in the green uh, plus red minus cell, the latency was at least uh, five milliseconds, if not more at lower intensities, again, suggesting a small cell with small microvillar count. The next we used was uh, its uh, polarization sensitivity because uh, you can use polarization sensitivity measurements to estimate the microvillar orientation of the cells. And uh, both uh, cells in this opponent pair had maximal response at a vertical polarizer, which is in this case 90 degrees. So the green unit responded with the polarization maximally at 90 degrees and 270 degrees and the red unit maximally inhibited the response at 90 degrees. So this suggests that its microvilli are vertical. Now the only vertical cells in butterfly omatidia are either R1 and 2, which as we've shown express either UV, blue or green opsin, and the only remaining candidate with vertical microvilli is the basal R9 cell. So again, a proof that uh, this red unit is due to the R9 cell. We then mapped the receptive field of this opponent uh, units in the pair using a DLP projector and stimulation with red or green stimuli. And we uh, observed that the two receptive fields in the green and in the red, uh, the depolarization and the opponent response always overlapped, which means that there is no pooling across the retina. So the red unit is able to convey opponent responses from within the single omatidium. Not a bad performance for such a tiny cell. Lastly, we developed uh, an optical model, a very simple one, where we, we largely ignored the waveguide optics. Uh, so we just uh, suppose that uh, the rhabdom of the omatidium was a slab of uh, units containing uh, different uh, opsins. And we showed that the basal cell, uh, just due to the filtering with green uh, cells above, 
uh, can express the green opsin and turn out into a red sensitive unit, which is this violet uh, curve. But these red reflecting gomatidia contain the red screening pigment, which we were also able to measure with uh, microspectrophotometry. Um, and uh, these cells, um, uh, this pigment suppresses the sensitivity in the green range, which ultimately allowed us to do this uh, selective adaptation experiments. So it creates really a sharp piking, uh, picking uh, red unit. Um, so R9 in Omatidia with red screen pigment is a good candidate for this red receptor. This is perfectly in line with what has been suggested by Page and Randolph Menzel many years ago for the honeybees, which also have R9 cell. There, it was shown that uh, only due to the filtering with green opsins uh, in the distal tiers, the basal cell turns into a red unit. So to conclude, uh, the opponent processing in infallid butterflies is conveyed through long visual fibers, R1 and, and 2, which in the case of trichromatic retina with uh, non-mosaic eye shine, express UV or blue opsins and receive opponent signals from R3 to R8 receptors, never in the opposite direction. Uh, the R3 to R8 never uh, have opponent signals. And uh, this has evolved into fully blown tetrachromacy possibly uh, by developing a new omatidial type where R1 and R2 express a green opsin and receive opponent input from a red sensitive R9 unit, which is created with optical tearing and red screening pigment. The question remains, what is R9 doing in the non uh, red um, omatidia, it's possibly just a long wavelength receptor because um, there must be a way for long wavelength information to go to the medulla. We've got one minute left, Gregor. Yes, I'm finished. Uh, so R9 in uh, Lepidoptera, um, uh, Lepidoptera has probably a, a wider role. We screen in phallic butterflies, but excellent candidates remain as senior butterflies at least. And more importantly, Hymenopterans are also good candidates to have R9 as red uh, receptors, such as have been shown in many honeybees by Page and Menzel years ago. I would just like to thank to our butterfly suppliers, uh, Costa Rica entomology supply, Mark Yals, who supplied Tapatura, our founders, Air Force Office of Scientific Research, Slovenia Research Agency. We have a lab page where you can check uh, our uh, publications and lab members. And I would like to point you to the lecture by Primo Spirich, occurring in about two hours, where he will develop this optical model a little bit further. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Gregor. Everyone, please drop questions in the chat. Um, and Marissa, Sarah McDonald, I believe you are up next. If you could go ahead and share your screen. Hi, yes, thank you. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep, looks good, we can hear you. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Marissa McDonald and I'm a current PhD candidate at the University of Hawaii at Manoa under Dr. Megan Porter. And I'll be talking about some of my dissertation research today, investigating the spectral sensitivity of larval somatopod crustaceans. So we got an introduction to somatopods earlier, but just a brief overview. Adult somatopods are well studied because they have the most complex eyes currently known in the animal kingdom. Um, they have trinocular eyes, as was mentioned, um, with the two hemispheres. Um, and the most of the complexity in that specialized mid-band row, where they have up to 12 color photoreceptors, as well as the ability to see linear and circular polarized light. And they're one of the only animals that can see polarized light, a circular polarized light. They also have up to six distinct UV photoreceptors, um, which is pretty unheard of diversity in the UV. But what about the larval somatopods, which is the focus of my research? So larval somatopods are interesting because they are physiologically, the, the eyes are physiologically and morphologically distinct from the adult. When they metamorphosize, the adult retina will grow in adjacent to the larval retina and form all new neural connections and then degenerate back into the body. The larval retina, therefore, is completely distinct and lacks the majority of the specializations of that adult eye. Larval eyes have long been described as simple, with a single photoreceptor type peaking in the blue portion of the spectrum between 450 and 500 nanometers, which corresponds to uh, the 
open ocean environment they inhabit. However, recent evidence indicates that the larvae are likely more complex than this and than once believed. And there's evidence that they actually have multiple sexual channels. Um, my lab mate, Sitara Palaconda, has been investigating the options um, in larval somatopods and has found they not only have the short wavelength sensitive blue, but also have multiple UV and long wavelength options. So with that in mind, I was interested in testing if they are also physiologically responding to wavelengths um, outside of the blue. So I've been testing the physiological and behavioral spectral sensitivity in three species of larval somatopod crustaceans that are found around Oahu, Hawaii. I've been testing these three species, Sonodactylacea falcatus, which is a uh, reef swelling species, typically in shallow reef flats. Sonodactylacea new species, which is a new species currently being described by the Porter Lab, um, and is also a shallow reef species. And Poyoswilla species, which is a, a, a sand burrowing, very small mantis shrimp, typically in shallow water. So to perform these experiments, I have been collecting as eggs um, and egg clutches and then raising them in the lab. So I've been culturing them uh, in the lab um, where they're placed on a table rocker until they are hatched and then uh, maintained in fresh water with a supply of artemia daily. Um, I've then been doing a retinogram or ERG recording on these three species to measure their spectral sensitivity. So to do this, the larvae are restrained these larvae are about three millimeters long when I'm working with them. So this white here uh, um, with the black box is a larvae on a pinhead, which is what they're typically restrained on. An electrode is then placed subcorneally into the eye, and I can then give flashes of light to take those measurements. So spectral sensitivity curves were completed from 350 to 650 nanometers. And I also used four different adaptations or light adaptations. Dark, um, where the eye was fully dark adapted, um, which is to visualize the dominant sensitivity. And then I used three chromatic adaptations, which work to photoactivate the eye um, in particular portions of the spectrum to visualize any secondary photoreceptor peak. Um, so I then did, uh, did peak sensitivities, which were determined using a multi pigment model um, with the Govardhati visual pigment template. So I'm just going to walk through my results for each of these three species. So under dark adaptation and gonadactylaceous falcatus, we saw a relatively uh, standard profile with that LMAX at modeled at 460. But under the adaptation of a 495 cut-on Montas filter, um, we see a peak sensitivity in the UV, this one modeled at 340. With a broadband blue chromatic adaptation, we see a third spectral sensitivity peak uh, peaking at 581. And there is potential for a secondary um, blue peak there, though I need to do a bit more model fitting to figure that out. So there's at least three clear spectral sensitivity peaks. In gonadactylelis, we see a very similar trend. Um, this one had a uh, lambda max at 457, again, within those expected boundaries um, in the blue portion of the spectrum. And then under the adapting light, you see a UV peak, this one at 376, and uh, another peak under the blue adapting light at 578. So this is showing three clear peaks in these three animals with the dominant peak in the blue. So our third species, I just want to introduce you if you are not aware um, of this paper that came out this last year, um, where a long wavelength reflecting filter was found in the larval retina in uh, the mantis shrimp family Nanoscolidae. Um, and it's so far only been identified in this family. And this long, uh, this long wavelength filter is an inner abdominal filter that reflects um, long wavelength light onto the distal portion of the retina. So while this has been identified, it has not been tested yet to determine how, if, how this is changing the physiological response of the eye. I found that under dark adaptation in Poyoswilla, um, which is in the family Nanoscolidae, they actually had a long wavelength um, sensitive peak, this one modeled at 602 nanometers. Under chromatic adaptations, we see a very similar trend to the other uh, species with a blue peak at 464 and a UV peak at 358. So just to sum that up, we found in all three species we have yet tested, there's a UV, a blue, and a yellow-orange um, sensitivity peak. Um, 
so this is really interesting as this is only, only a blue peak had been identified previously and this corresponds really well to the Austin data that's come out of our lab. I have also run behavioral response spectrum in order to uh, determine how the animals are responding behaviorally across the spectrum. And this was completed um, with the same light across 350 to 650 nanometers at 30 nanometer intervals again. And the trials were completed in a horizontal phototaxis chamber, which I constructed from UV transmissive plastic. And this chamber has a lid that separates the chamber into five uh, equally sized sections that can be raised and lowered to uh, open or close those sections simultaneously. So during a trial, five larvae were placed in the middle chamber and left the dark adapt. And the light was then shined a longitudinal axis for 45 seconds and the larvae were allowed to free swim, after which the lid was replaced and positive phototaxis was described as movement to the chamber nearest the light at the end of the trial. Results were then analyzed with a one-way ANOVA with the Dunnett post hoc test. What we found is that in all three species, um, they seem to all respond relatively uh, across the whole UV to visual spectrum with high response in the UV. And even if it was significant, um, a decreasing response in the longer wavelength, to none of them having a significant response at 650 nanometers, which is beyond the bounds of our currently tested uh, curve. So this is interesting because not only can they see across this, they are behaviorally responding positively across the UV to visual spectrum. So to summarize, larval somatophods have at least three clear spectral sensitivity peaks, one each in the UV, blue, and yellow orange regions of the spectrum. And this is in all three species we've tested so far, which uh, are encompassed two of the three main somatophod superfamilies. And the Poyo squilla um, has a orange dominant eye, which is likely driven by the recently described interabdomal filter, which has been really exciting to see. All three species also display positive phototaxis across the majority of the UV to visual spectrum. So not only are they having a physiological response, they're also having a behavioral response across the full spectrum. So with that, I would like to thank my lab, um, particularly to Tara, Mireille, Sophia, and Gracie, as they've been helping me collect and raise these larvae. Uh, Dr. John Cohen for all of his help on electrophysiology and Kate Feller for her uh, help throughout this project, my funding sources, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much. We have time for um, some, for probably one question, maybe two questions. Uh, if anyone wants to put them in the chat. Can I jump in with a question, Amanda? Oh yeah, Amanda? go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, so what, what could they possibly be using a, this redshifted receptor for in, in, in nature? There's not a lot of red light that they'd be interested in, and they don't have a, a behavioral phototactic response to it. What would you think they might be using red for? Yeah, so uh, at least in terms of the interabdomal filter, the theory was that they're using it to hunt for bioluminescent prey at night. Um, so potentially it's to track bioluminescent signatures, um, which could be, which are often long wavelength shifted. Thanks. That's pretty cool. Does uh, anyone have any other question? Yeah, is there a question? I was, I was able to keep the larvae alive for about a month um, so far. I have not gotten them to settle into uh, or metamorphosize in the lab, but they'll stay alive in the lab for around a month. Maybe a bit more. The methods are also lethal, so at some point they tend to be used. I have one other last quick question. Um, so you had the different peaks for the different species, um, but they weren't like sort of exactly in the same place. There was some variation in there. Do you think there's any biological like meaning to that? Or is it just like, do they occur in different environments? Uh, yeah, I don't really know. I'm a plant person, but just curious if that variation might have any sort of meaning. Yeah, um, I'm not sure yet. They theoretically should occur in the same environment. I'm collecting them in similar places, although um, there hasn't been extensive sampling to figure out where these different species are going before they come back to shore. So they could be slightly different, although they're all theoretically near shore Wahoo species, at least as adults. So why there might be some shifts in peaks, um, I'm not sure yet ecologically. Great, well, thank you very much. Um, if anyone else has any other questions for Marissa, just throw them in the chat. Uh, and with that, we will move on to um, Gabor Pitzer. Are you here? Can you share your screen? Yes, I'm here. Perfect. I hope you can see the slides. Yeah, we can see it. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Gábor Pister, and I'm from the Institute of Technical Physics and Material Science from Budapest, Hungary. And I'm going to present you uh, the concordance of the spectral properties of the Arzal Rings chaos and the phylogeographic structure of European male common blue butterflies. And this work was carried out in collaboration with the Evolutionary Phylogenomics Research Group in Debrecen and also with the Hungarian Natural History Museum. Here you can see the brief outline of my talk. First, I'm going to introduce you the structure of color and the photoreton structures of common blue male butterflies. Then I'm going to show you that we found two main structural color variants in Europe and in Asia, and they had a significant shift in the peak wavelengths. Therefore, we developed the novo DNA microsatellites, which we were used for genetic analysis of more than uh, 80 European specimens. And we found remarkably good concordance between the spectral properties of the structural color and the population genetic structure of this species. Here you can see a male common blue butterfly with a nice blue structural color on its dorsal wing surface. Uh, it has a, a important, it is important in its life. Therefore, it had a strong evolutionary pressure and distilled over the millennia of evolution. And if we put this butterfly wing under an optical microscope, you can see in the middle the arrangement of the scales, which are like ties on the roof. And you can see that the topmost layer of the source of this, the structural coloration. To get higher magnifications, uh, we used an SCM, a scanning electron microscope, which can reveal the micro and nanostructure of these wing scales. And you can see this sponge-like chitin matrix with embedded air holes which is a three-dimensional photoreton structure, and this is the source of the blue coloration. And in a cross-sectional image, in a trans the transmission electron microscope, you can see that this is a multi-layer-like, but uh, a bit amorphous or disordered structure with chitin-rich and air-rich layers on each other. And when we measure uh, the structure or color of a common blue butterfly with an optical spectrophotometer. We usually get these types of um, reflectance spectra with a main peak in the blue between the UV and the blue around 400, nanometer, 400 nanometers. And first, we wanted to test uh, the temporal stability of the structure or colors in the case of common blue. Therefore, we made a selection of examples from back to, one, back to 100 years from the Budapest region. And we measured more, uh, these more than 100 exemplars and averaged the data by 30 years. And you can see we also normalized the blue peak. And you can see also that, that uh, these are almost coincident. The structural part of these reflectance is almost coincident showing that this color is stable over a period of 100 years. And differences only can be seen in the reflectance part of the melanin, which is um, due to the photodegradation of this uh, pigment. After this, we wanted to know what's the natural variability of the structure or color in a local population. Therefore, we investigated the butterfly fauna near our institute in Budapest. And we measured, I think, more than 50 exemplars from the same uh, location from the same day. And we found that the spectral positions, so the peak of the blue, uh, yeah, the maximum of the blue peak has a plus minus 10 nanometers variance, naturally, in a local population. So this can be regarded as a baseline of the natural variability. Because when we investigated larger distances, uh, we wanted to compare the variance of data, the data in the whole Eurasian continent to this, uh, what I showed you in the earlier slide. You can see the selection of the available museum exemplars, which we investigated. 
from Spain to South Korea. And the size of the red dots show the number of the specimens of the site. We had more than 300 exemplars. And we found that actually uh, there are two main color variants, one in Europe and one in Asia. Uh, you can see that um, we investigated distant and coherent regions, test regions, and you can see the average spectra of the regions here. But you can see that there is uh, there are two similar uh, spectra from Europe and two similar spectra from Asia, but there is a 20 nanometer shift between them, which is which also can be seen. Uh, in the histograms when we analyze all the data collected in these areas. So there are two uh, structural color variants of the common blue. And we wanted to investigate if there are any uh, genetic difference between the European males and also between the Asian males. Therefore, first we investigated the European specimens and we caught 80 fresh butterflies in France, Hungary, and Romania. And these were from four populations, one from France and one from Romania, and 1,600 uh, kilometers in between. And we also had two close populations from near Budapest. First, we measured their wing reflectances, and we found that there are only minor spectral differences between the four sampling sites. You can see the averages here and the box diagrams. And also this was in accordance with our previous results, which were, uh, which were measured on museum exemplars. You can see that this was the average of the Central East European plain and the Adriatic coast specimens. And the four new uh, populations are around that value and far from the Asian butterflies. After that, we wanted to investigate the genetic differences, if there are any, between the European males. Therefore, the genetic analysis was based on single sequence repeats, or so-called microsatellites of the DNA, which are in the non-coding part, but they are a good choice for tracking genetic variability of natural populations. We developed de novo 10 microsatellites and used them for uh, classification. You can see the PCA results, the PCA scores plot of the four populations here, which are almost identical, and only a negligible level of differentiation can be seen. Also, with the Bayesian structuring, only minor differences can, work, can be seen between the four populations. And the obvious, obvious question is, I'm sorry, before that, so we found a remarkably good uh, concordance between the genetic and the spectral properties of the European males. But the obvious question is, what's up with the Asian butterflies? Uh, this is our current work, so I, can, I cannot show you current, uh, the current results or the recent results, only some preliminary data. As the last slide, you can see that the principal component scores plot of the European and the Asian males is completely different that I showed you earlier than from that I showed you earlier. You can see that the Europeans are also in one group, but they are distinct from the Asian ones. They are well separated. And also we found that there is a linear relationship between the genetic and the geographic distance of these butterflies. So there, there are correlation. There is correlation between the uh, genetic distance and uh, the location of the populations. And we hope that this is uh, only the start of this work. So we hope in the future maybe we can reveal some other correlations between the genome and the structural color. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gabor. Super interesting. Um, anybody has any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I was wondering about uh, how, so you have these 
interesting patterns about European and Asian ones being like a little bit different. Um, did you notice any patterns within Europe or within Asia? Um, uh, sorry, notice any patterns. I mean, like notice any clear geographic patterns in color no, variation. Not over... really, not really. They are really similar. So okay. only, only we only found, uh, found like a couple of nanometer differences, but this could be only a statistical error. So only five nanometers shift on 1600 kilometers. So they are pretty similar in terms of structural coloration. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder. Um, Abel Chow is a question. He asks, uh, what package or program did you use to analyze your spectral reflectance data? Uh, the spectral reflectance data. Um, I, um, I used the um, Origin, Origin Pro, so not a statistical package, um, but there, there was a built-in statistics part in Origin software. All right. Um, well, I think if anyone else has any other questions for Gabor, please throw them in the chat. Um, our next speaker actually is not able to make it. And so we're just going to have a little bit of a coffee break, chat break, bathroom break, whatever kind of break you might need. Um, but we're going to come right back. It'll be in 10 minutes from now. So we're going to try to start right on the time uh, when that when the following talk was supposed to start. So a little bit of a 10 minute break. Don't go too far. Put more questions in the chat. Um, and we'll see you all back here. For me, it's 11.24 at night. I don't know what time it is where you are. Um, but great. So we'll see you all in a few minutes. And if anyone wants to discuss in here while uh, we're on break, just uh, feel free to chat. Uh, just mute yourself when we come back for the talks in 10 minutes. Yeah, go for it. It always kind of blows my mind how many receptors some of these like mantis shrimp and, and other things have. <laughs> like, why mantis do shrimp need and so butterflies many? are butterflies and mantis shrimp are the absurdist uh, outliers in the number of uh, spectral receptor classes. But but butterflies are flying mantis shrimp. <laughs> Luckily, they're peaceful. <laughs> Mike, I've already had six, 600 milliliters of coffee. Is more coffee a bad idea? I guess probably. Well, well, it's it's that, early. You have time to digest about it. About halfway through this. So. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot how much coffee you guys drink. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. 5 a.m. getting up is not my ideal uh, timing, but it's pretty early. <laughs> It's hard though to find a time. No, it doesn't. There's no time that works for everybody in the world. So I resolve this by sleeping only two hours. <laughs> I'm gonna run and feed Charlie quick. I'll be back. Yeah, go for it. Now's the now's the time to do it for sure. Oh good, 3 15 p.m. in Sydney. Excellent. It's a good solid, good, good time of day. We wanted to make sure that there was at least like some time that worked for everybody and wasn't terrible for everybody. That was the goal. So. Well, it's not fair to leave out like whole regions of the world just because of time zone. So. <laughs> well, you're definitely going to have trouble getting, getting Guam in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there was I'm somewhere not. that was like, no, none of these are good. <laughs> I'm glad I got switched to this session. My first slot was at four in the morning, Hawaii time. Oh, yeah, it was <laughs> it was a bit of juggling to try to get people, like get everyone at a good time zone for them, but then also not just have like everybody from one university or like everybody who just knew each other all presenting at the same time. So it was a bit of juggling, but I'm glad you didn't have to present at 4 a.m. That would have been pretty rough. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> I can't take any credit for the scheduling. That was almost entirely Rox who did all of the hard work on. Well, she she was the she is the mastermind behind all of this, but she's the one who really did all the hard work on the scheduling. So, 
Yeah. I'm impressed for anybody. The one person said that she was there at one in the morning and I was like, wow, that is devotion. Like I I'm grateful for anyone who shows up at that time of day, but like, wow, that is devotion. (sighs) Have you all been enjoying the talk so far? I think I'm going to get some water, but I'll be back. We'll start. I think we have six minutes. So. Hello, Miranda. I'd just like to say hello. Hello. Oh, Paul, Paul, Paul hi. <laughs> hello. <laughs> yeah, I still have a bag of them in my fridge and I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, we, we're going to try and do some chemical analysis in Cambridge, I think, for those things. But um Oh, cool. Um, we'll see. But uh, it's, I think it's a very interesting conclusion. That yeah. You find it in the fish. <laughs> yeah. I am really curious if it's the same thing or not, or, you know, that, it, that, that would be super weird if it was like very yeah. similar to the fish. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a fascinating story over many years, but uh, I'm really enjoying this. I'm finding out all kinds of things. Oh, great. Yeah. I'm trying to work on worms at the moment. And uh, oh. uh, we, we think they're, they're being poisoned by light pollution because of the protoporphyrin in the skin. Oh, wow. And uh, That's it's cool. true of nematodes as well. They, they react very badly to blue light and uh, oh. they love red light. Oh, wow. And, uh, so this is, this is all to do with our research on, on eyes and macular degeneration at UCL. <clears throat> you know, we're trying to understand what the blue light actually does in the eye, and uh, and the red light seems to protect from the um, adverse effects of the blue light. Are, are these earthworms you, that are being poisoned by the blue light? Or yeah, earthworms, if, you, or, yeah. If, you, if you if you watch uh, after a rainstorm when the sun comes out, uh, you find all the worms that come up on, on the ground, and if they're if they're caught over concrete or pavement, and the sun comes out, they all die. Um, it was thought because they dried out, but in fact, I think it's uh, protoporphyrin uh, killing them with reactive oxygen. So it's like a, a worm version of porphyria, and uh, um, the nematodes also react very badly to, to blue light. It was thought to be UV light, but it's actually blue light in the sorry band of the porphyry. And this is, th- this is the process that photodynamic uh, therapists use for killing cancer cells. They shine, in the early days, they shone blue light on protoporphyrin, and that killed the cells. Now they, now they do it using red uh, photoactive substances, but the original uh, discovery was with protoporphyrin. And also this protoporphyrin uh, acts as a bacterial agent in the shells of uh, bird's eggs. Oh, so yeah. when a bird lays, a, lays an egg, it, print, it inkjet prints protoporphyrin on the eggshell. And for a long time it was not understood what the purpose of that was, but now it seems that it, it provides a coating on the eggshell which under daylight illumination produces reactive oxygens, which kills certain types of bacteria. So <laughs> it's, an amazing, it's an amazing world that uh, <laughs> astrophysicists get into <laughs> when they retire. <laughs> yeah, wow, it's so cool. So uh, actually the, the work on worms here has been very interesting for me to see what the, the photoreceptors might be, but you know, our feeling is that worms don't necessarily see blue, but they actually feel it. Because hmm. it's probably very painful to be uh, subjected to, to blue light like this. But, and our aim is to get rid of all the 4,000 Kelvin white street lamps that have been plastered over our planet over the last uh, 10 years, because they're death rays, they're killing every, everything. Yeah. They're probably responsible for some of the uh, collapse in the insect populations 
as well. So, oh, there's a talk coming up later about light pollution and hawk moths. So. I know that's what I got up for. One <laughs> of the ones I got up for. <laughs> <laughs> okay well you're going to start soon so i'll mute, mute myself and uh you carry on okay nice to, nice to see you anyway <laughs> yeah nice to to sort of meet you officially i'm going to bring those um ravenella seeds with me to cambridge when i go in a few weeks so oh okay yeah Good. so we'll have Thanks. a lot more for you to play Good. around okay. with. <laughs> yes wonderful thank you yeah Um, all right, so. Okay. Carla, I believe is next up. We're still, we're still yeah. like 30 seconds ahead of time, but I just thought I would. It's all right. I'm just gonna start sharing the screen then. Yeah, go for it. Well, we'll, we'll wait just so we're right on time. Um, okay. For people who are um, coming back. <laughs> great. Can you see my screen? Yeah. And can you hear me? Okay. Yep, okay. can see and hear perfectly. Okay, perfect. Then if it's all right, I'm just gonna go for it. Um, well, um, thank you first for organizing this. Um, my name is Carla Lopez. And today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, the research that I've been conducting recently. And I'm gonna talk about color attraction and color vision of the Western flower thrips. So I guess a lot of you are actually wondering what is a Western flower thrips? And thrips are um, insects and they belong to their own order called Thysanoptera. And they are usually very um, extremely small insects. They measure around one to 1 1.5 millimeters. And Western flower thrips is one of the 6,000 described species of this order. And it's also one of the most important um, pest species around the world. It is a greenhouse pest spread worldwide and it damages uh, various amounts of crops, important um, agricultural crops and ornamental crops. Um, and it causes huge economic losses, um, mainly due to transmission of TOSPA viruses and also um, cosmetic damage. And it is very difficult to control. It, because of its size, um, it is able to hide in very small spaces, usually inside plant structures such as flowers. And it has also been found to be resistant to several kinds of insecticides. So in recent years, there's an increase in interest in improving tra trapping systems um, for Western flower thrips, and not just for monitoring, but also for control strategies of these pests inside greenhouses. Um, such as mass trapping or other um, strategies such as lure and infect or lure and kill. So the main purpose is to actually be able to attract thrips on mass. So this is, um, these are a few pictures of what is actually happening um, in greenhouses with farmers. And this is the state of the art technology of traps is just um, colored sticky traps basically, uh, and they use them for monitoring, but also many farmers are trying to use this um, to, uh, or attempting to attract them in large quantities in order to manage the populations in the greenhouses. And the two main colors that are being used um, commercially are blue and yellow. However, um, the technology for trapping, as you can see, has not really advanced too much. And this is for the last five or six decades. So in order to increase um, trap att attraction by using visual stimuli, um, I think it is key to study the color attraction and the color vision of the Western flower thrips. We know that the thrips have strong visually guided behaviors and they are mainly attracted to, attracted to blue and yellow, but there's many varying results in literature and we still don't understand why sometimes they are attracted to blue and why sometimes they are attracted to yellow. So there is an ongoing debate um, in literature about this. And for sticky traps, which are basically reflecting surfaces, um, in older studies, it was not able to differentiate or independently, independently assess um, intensity from color. So it's really hard to know 
whether results from previous studies were due to color attraction, due to, the, to intensity, or due to a combination of both. And until now, actually, still very little is understood about color attraction and color vision and the visual system um, of these really cool and interesting insects. So more recently, um, people have started to use LEDs to evaluate color attraction and phototaxis of these species. So that means that now we can actually control way better for intensity. And I'm going to show you some results from very recent studies from a group from Germany. And they basically evaluated the color attraction of Western flower thrips. And they found um, very high attraction to blue and very little attraction to yellow. And they were rearing their lab colony um, on beans and bean, uh, and bean plants. And then in the meantime, while these studies were being published, I started my PhD. And I had a setup um, in a wind tunnel in the Netherlands, in the University of Wageningen. And I had a LED lamp where I could put different LEDs and evaluate different colors. And I was rearing my population from the Netherlands in um, yellow flower chrysanthemum plants. And this is the setup um, that I was using. And of course, I wanted to evaluate the color vision of the population I was working with. And um, I would release the thrips in this very small container that you see here in the platform in the middle of the wind tunnel. And then I would be able to record the landing six hours after releasing them. And we, cho we chose to use a wind tunnel because it gave enough space for the thrips to fly freely and not in a restricted space. Because usually, because they are so small, um, people tend to use very restrictive spaces to evaluate them behaviorally because it's really hard to see them. And we also thought that um, having some wind flow in the, in the wind tunnel would potentially help to induce the thrips to fly upwind. And additionally, I had a very um, good setup and I could control very well the intensity of the lights that I was using. And I was able to have them all at the same intensity to remove this variable from, from the studies. And then these, these were my results. And adding to the blue-yellow debate, um, my results were actually quite the opposite of what these um, German studies has, had shown. I had um, significantly higher attraction to yellow and lower <coughs> attraction to blue. So just to remind you guys, these are the the results from the from the German study. So this was very puzzling and interesting at the same time. And we thought like, is it methodological differences that it's causing these um, behavioral preference differences in, in, in this um, species? Could it be there is actually a true differences between the populations? Could it be the host plant that we are using for rearing them that is affecting the results? And the only way to actually um, respond these questions was to investigate both populations in the same setup, um, under the same methodology, same experimental design, and the same host plant regime. So we contacted um, the research group from Germany, and they kindly agreed to send me some Western flower thrips from their population so that I could use them in the following experiment that I'm going to show you guys. So what I did is um, that I had the two populations and I gave them a choice. And it was between blue and yellow because this is the what we were mostly interested in. And these are the, the results. And what I would like you guys to focus on first is that the difference in color preference in blue and yellow were very were strongly significant between the, the two populations. So the German populations had high preference for blue, little for yellow, and the population from the Netherlands was the complete opposite. High attraction to yellow, very little to blue. And then apart from that, I also evaluated the host plant effect. And we found that when the Western flower thrips were reared on chrysanthemum, 
there was an increase in yellow preference compared to when they were being reared on beans. And um, even though the, the effect of host plant regime was smaller than the difference between population, it was still significant. And I think this is very important thing um, to note, especially when using lab reared colonies. So this is actually um, the first study that shows that different populations of Western flower trips can have different color uh, preferences. And this is hugely important because it needs to be considered not just when one is looking at previous literature and trying to interpret the results, but I think it's especially important for future studies um, evaluating the color attraction and color vision of Western flower trips, especially when using um, lab-reared colonies, which a lot of the studies um, do. So thrips do show complex behaviors and they have color discrimination capabilities that are pretty cool. And moving on to um, behavior, um, we think that in order to advance the understanding of color attraction in this group of insects, it is key to study their visual system, their eyes and their eye physiology. So I'm just gonna show you um, really quickly what's the next step moving on from behavior to a more physiology and anatomy approach in my research. So um, thrips have very interesting adaptation despite their remarkably um, small size. And they seem to have specialized region between the dorsal and the ventral part of the, um, of the eye here. And um, <coughs> we see some anatomical differences in the abdomen structure from some TM that we have done. And also here in the ventral part, we, ha we have found that, are some, that there are some omatidia that fluoresce under different lights. And we think that there are some filtering mechanism going on there that could um, help to tune the underlying photoreceptors. And just so that everyone knows there are actually we still don't know the spectral sensitivity of the photoreceptors on this um, group of insects or on Western flower thrips. And- um, We've got one minute left, Carla. Okay, thank you. And um, lastly, actually now, um, last year, the, the Western flower thrip genome project was um, published. And now it is actually possible to conduct also obscene gene analysis. So this is where we think that um, the study of the visual system of these animals should go ahead. And that's where we, you know, we are heading to. And with all of this together, hopefully, um, it will help us to increase our understanding of the color attraction and color vision of thrips. And just to end, I would like to acknowledge all institutions that have helped with either um, data gathering and funding. And thank you very much for your attention. And this is a slow motion video of a thrips taking off. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Carla. Um, I think we probably don't have time for questions. So if you have questions, Sorry. put them in the chat. Um, but otherwise, James Foster, I believe you are up next if you'd like to share your screen. Yep. Okay. So are you now seeing my screen? Yes, indeed. Um, we can hear screen? you too. Excellent. Uh, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is James Foster. I am a research fellow at the University of Würzburg in Germany. I'll be talking today about my work on the effects of light polluted skies on celestial orientation in dung beetles. Uh, this is work that I carried out during my postdoc at Lund University in Sweden with Marie Dacke in collaboration with our partners at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. And I would like to thank all of our funders and all of you for tuning in from around the world at different times. But wherever you are right now, I'd actually like you to imagine yourself somewhere different. That is the South African savanna at night. 
it's a relatively flat environment, very few tall trees or rocks. And as you move through this habitat, I can tell you from personal experience, one tree starts to look very much like another and it's very easy to become lost. Luckily for me and the animals that live in this environment, there's many a clear starry night like this one and the stars make for an excellent compass. One of those species is our study animal, nocturnal dung beetle Scarabaeus satyrus. So this species constructs itself a dung ball, which it then climbs on top of, performs a short rotational dance during which it registers the available orientation cues. And it then climbs down and rolls that ball away from the dung pile, escaping the region of high competition around it reaching a distance where it can safely bury and consume its ball without being disturbed by other beetles which might try to steal its food. And, and they do this by traveling in as straight a line as possible. In fact there seems to be some kind of detente between um, different beetles that they choose a random direction and by traveling in a straight line they generally manage to avoid each other which avoids um, costly battles over dung balls and to do this they use a compass um, a celestial compass and at night that means using the stars indeed they're not the only species of animal to use a star compass it's quite well established that night migrating birds also use a star compass, which Emlyn was able to demonstrate in planetarium experiments, appears to be based on identifying patterns of stars around the center of celestial rotation. You can also put dung beetles in a planetarium and they're able to exit a three meter arena in about the same time it takes them under natural skies. But if we switch off all the stars except for the bright ones that we or birds might use for navigation, the beetles perform quite poorly. They actually perform much better if we only show them this dim streak of the Milky Way across the sky. And those of you who attended the keynote yesterday um, might already be thinking that this probably has something to do with acuity and eye design. Humans and birds have camera eyes that are very good at resolving the dark spaces between stars, whereas these dung beetles have superposition compound eyes with a facet spacing of about four degrees, where we expect the best case scenario would be something like this, patches of stars blurring together into luminous blobs. In fact, it seems quite likely that the beetles aren't even using their eyes to their best ability in terms of resolving patterns. And when presented with an artificial Milky Way, the beetles were unable to orient using patterns within that Milky Way, but very well oriented using a general intensity gradient across the sky. And this would be adaptive under natural conditions. Um, in the southern hemisphere, it's possible to view a brightness gradient across the Milky Way, across the, from north to south with increasing star density under, on most clear nights. Unfortunately for the dung beetles and other animals that might be using the stars, many a starry night no longer looks like this. It looks much more like this, with artificial light projected up into the sky, scattered back down towards the observer in the form of sky glow, which obscures all but the very brightest of stars. Indeed, this is not just a problem in South Africa. The authors of this Atlas of Light Pollution estimate that about a third of the world's population can already not see the Milky Way at night. So we wondered how this might be affecting these beetles that are relying on the Milky Way as their compass. To be able to compare orientation performance under different conditions, we allowed each of our beetles to roll to the edge 
of a one meter arena 10 times, recording the exit bearing each time, and then calculating this mean vector you'll see in blue on the bottom right from uh, those exit bearings. And I'll be using the length of this mean vector as a measure of orientation performance. And this is an experiment that we performed simultaneously at our dark sky site in rural Limpopo and at our light polluted site on the roof of the University of the Witwatersrand in central Johannesburg. And during each of these experiments, we used a calibrated camera system to measure the visual scene. We could then post-process these images using methods developed by Don Nielsen and Jochen Smolka into estimates of spectral radiance at lung beetle resolution. And that's what you're seeing here in these two azimuth elevation projections. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the scene at a light polluted site, and on the right-hand side, at our dark sky site. You can see that the sky at the light polluted site is about one to two log units brighter than at the dark sky site. And that made it all the more surprising to us that the beetles at our light polluted site were actually very well oriented. You see very long mean vectors going towards the edge of the unit circle at both sites. And in fact, they were even able to maintain this performance when skies were overcast. Um, while beetles at the dark sky site were much worse oriented under these conditions, much shorter mean vectors. And since the, there were clouds obscuring celestial cues, this suggests that beetles at the light polluted site were actually not relying on celestial cues anymore. Um, this is something that we tested by repeating our experiment from the, on a clear sky night, but with darkened walls surrounding the arena that blocked everything below 60 degrees of elevation from view, so that beetles at both sites could view only this small patch of sky. And this basically reversed the effect. You see now that beetles at the light polluted site viewing only the light polluted sky were disoriented, while beetles at our dark sky site viewing only this small patch of starry sky were relatively well oriented. So this seems to suggest that although indirect light pollution obscures the stars from view, causing beetles to become disoriented, um, beetles seem to be able to compensate by relying on direct light pollution. Uh, from surrounding buildings and mounted lights. And this is something we're able to confirm in the one in the last experiment I'll be showing you today, which was conducted at our dark sky site near a building with a bright floodlight. On the left-hand side, you see when the floodlight was switched off, the beetles dispersed in all directions and were well oriented as they are under natural conditions. However, when we turned this floodlight on, the same beetles changed their orientation strategy, all orienting towards the floodlight. Uh, at this point, you should be starting to question our measure of orientation performance. Yes, these beetles are orienting very accurately, but if you'll remember, the purpose of this behavior is for them to disperse through their environment and to find a good location to bury their ball. They are now, all dispersing in the same direction, very likely to encounter each other. And what's more, they're actually moving towards the least hospitable part of their environment, towards the building that this light is mounted on. But I think this experiment also offers us an example of an easy solution to this problem of light pollution interfering with animals' natural behavior. When the floodlight was switched off, beetles reverted to their normal behavior. And I think a very simple solution to the problem of light pollution is just to switch off unnecessary lights. But thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you so much. We have about a minute for questions. I have like maybe a silly question. Um, 
do dung beetles learn like can they do you think that they sort of learn their local environment and are able to adapt to that sort of regardless of the light it it sounds kind of strange to say but no i do oh. i've not seen any evidence of learning in any <laughs> dung beetles and at least in this case it's because these are beetles that fly around their environment each night in mm. search of a new dung pile. So they're basically starting in an unknown environment each time. And I think that's why they're so reliant on celestial cues under natural conditions, because the sky is always there and always something they can use if they're relying on sort of specific mm. trees or specific um, rocks, then that could easily fail each time that they start at a new dung pile. Hmm. Cool. Sounds good. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, we have to move on, but there might be some more questions in the chat. So Benito Wainwright, I believe you are up next if you'd like to share your screen. Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. Let me just share my screen. All right. Can you see that? Looks good. And we can hear you really well, too. Lovely. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Benito. I'm a PhD student in the EBAB lab with Dr. Stephen Montgomery at the University of Bristol, and I'm going to be speaking about brains and mimicry. So whenever there's a gap in nature, we know that nature will always do its best to fill that gap. And when we have that increased specialization to particular ecologies, we call that local adaptation. And if that happens multiple times, what the result is are these really impressive adaptive radiations that we see across the natural world. Examples being the Anolis lizards from the Caribbean, these beautiful Hawaiian honey creepers, and perhaps most impressively, these adaptive radiations of African cichlids. Now, we might imagine then, if we've got repeated shifts in ecology, then we're also seeing repeated shifts in the sensory environment in which these different species are living in. And that may in turn result in different sensory adaptations between these different species. Tropical butterflies are another great example of an adaptive radiation, in particular this tribe, the Ethomony. They're the most diverse tribe of neotropical butterfly with around 380 species to their name. And all species are toxic. And because of that, they've evolved these warning colors, aposematism, to advertise to predators that they're not good to eat. And that in turn has led to the evolution of what we call malarian mimicry, which is where multiple species converge on the same warning signals for their own mutual benefit, to enhance predator education, basically, to say that they wouldn't be a tasty morsel to have for lunch. And if you were to look at a phylogeny of these ethomonid butterflies, what you would see is repeated instances of divergence and convergence within a single rainforest community. And that's shown by the different colors and shapes on the tips of this phylogeny here. And the reason why we see so many different mimicry rings within a rainforest community is because it's been shown that these mimicry rings seem to be segre segregated by microhabitat. And that's because rainforests are really complex ecosystems. Um, and because of that, we might imagine that light availability within these forests also varies considerably. Um, now, the site which I'm studying is this community at Yasuni National Park in Ecuador. Um, but obviously, because of COVID restrictions, I haven't been able to actually go there yet, so I don't know firsthand what it looks like. So instead, this is what Yasuni National Park looks like in my dreams, which, by the way, is a more accurate depiction of what I look like normally at six o'clock in the morning. Um, so what we see is this incredible segregation between microhabitat. So let's say if I walked into this shaded area of the forest here, I'd see more of these butterflies with the orange wing tips. And if I move to more open areas, I'd see more of these kind of tiger stripe patterns. So repeated instances of divergence and convergence within a single community. Now, we can study adaptations to different sensory environments by looking at the butterfly brain. And this is what a butterfly brain looks like, or at least the volumetric reconstruction of it. 
And for this talk, basically all we're going to focus on here are these optic lobes, these yellow bulbous structures on either side of the brain here. And the optic lobes consist of various different neuropils, and they all have slightly different jobs. So we've got the medulla here, the lamina, lobular plate, the lobula, and these are what we call neuropils. And what's been shown in the past is that there seems to be considerable neuroanatomical variation between lepidopteran species. The main structures are conserved, but the relative investment in each structure varies considerably. And this seems to be linked to the sensory ecology of each species. So these ethominid butterflies are probably a really good model for studying how sensors evolve over relatively short evolutionary timescales. Now, today we're gonna to focus on two clades in that big ethominy phylogeny that I showed you earlier. They are the olerina, and they are what we call mimetically homogenous. And basically what I mean by that is all the species or nearly all the species within olerina look the same. They're part of the same mimicry ring. In our second clade, things are a little bit more complicated. In fact, it's so complicated, it's probably easier to split this new clade, the napiogenina, into two separate clades. You've got the napiogenes, which are pretty mimetically heterogeneous. Most of the species within the napiogenes are part of different mimicry rings. And then we've got the hypothyrus, which as you can see is relatively mimetically homogeneous. But what's great for our analysis is that there's very little overlap between the hypothyrus and the other mimetically homogeneous clade, um, the olerina. There's very little overlap in the mimicry rings in which the species belong to. So basically, our main hypothesis for this study is that shifts in mimicry predict shifts in sensory environments because different mimicry rings occupy different microhabitats. And just to summarize, these are what our clades are now. So we've got three clades now because we split um, Napiogenina into two. So how do we study a butterfly brain? Well, the kind of catchphrase of our lab is stain, scan and segment. And I was very lucky, actually, because before COVID happened, my supervisor, Stephen Montgomery, already went out into the field and collected around 500 ethomine brain samples, which he dissected and are now living in our laboratory freezer. So what we can then do is perform immunohistochemistry on those brains, which basically means staining them with antibodies, um, which means that the brains will fluoresce when we put them under a confocal microscope and scan them. And then once we've got those image stacks, we can then um, extract volumetric information from the different neuropils using 3D image segmentation software in a mirror. And they look a little bit like that. Now, after we've done that, there are various like, little housekeeping things we've got to do. So once we've extracted the volumes, we then log transfer them to normalize the residuals and basically make the data easier to work with. And then what we do is we scale each neuropil of interest against this quantity called RCBR, which stands, of the, stands for the rest of central brain. And what that is, is basically the volume of the central brain that I didn't segment, and it acts as an allometric control. It's ensuring that any differences in investment are due to differences in relative investment in that neuropil that we're interested in, rather than changes in overall brain size. So if these two lines represented two different species, then we could say that there's an adaptive shift in investment between them along the y-axis. Now, for this talk, we're gonna focus on the interclade variation. Um, because that's where most of the interesting results lie. And we studied that using linear mixed models. And we're gonna focus mainly on those two mimetically homogenous clades that I showed you earlier, the olerina and the hypothyrus. So what we've got here is the log of the medulla, which is one of the main optic neuropils, plotted against RCBR. And what we see is that the hypothyrus seem to be investing significantly more in visual neuropil than um, the olerina. And this is true for other neuropil within the optic lobe too. But <laughs> this is only significant if we exclude a species from olerina. 
because the eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that not all species within the olivina look the same. There's this species, Hyperscada anchiala, which is part of a completely different mimicry ring. And what we see is that the that Hyperscada anchiala seems to be investing significantly more um, in visual neuropil than other species within its clade. In fact, it's more similar to the levels of investment found within Hyperthyrus, which is interesting because the mimicry ring of Hyperscada anchiala is more similar to those tiger strike patterns that we find in Hyperthyrus. So overall then we can say that these homogenous tiger stripe patterns seem to invest more in visual neuropil and those homogenous kind of transparent um, species that we find in Olerina seem to be investing relatively less. Now I haven't got time to go into detail about what Napogenes is doing here but just as a kind of summary essentially what we see is that seems to be acting as a kind of in an intermediate between those two extremes. That's not to say that Napogenes shows more interspecies, interspecific variation, um, just that it seems to be acting more of a, more of a sensory generali generalist um, compared to the other two clades. But if you want to ask me more about that, then I'm happy to take questions. One other last little thing that we did is we incorporated some ecological variables in with this data, which is quite difficult when you're not able to go out in the field. Um, We've got one I'll... minute left, Benito. Brilliant, thanks. But I was lucky enough to um, get some fly type data from Marion Elias and coupled that with a phylogeny. And what we see is that species which fly higher in the forest canopy seem to be investing significantly more in visual neuropil, which is hopefully quite clear from that graph. And if we break it down into species, we can see that the Olerina, which invests less in visual neuropil, seem to be hunkered down here in the forest canopy, whereas those hyperthyrus, which invest more in visual neuropil, seem to be flying at higher elevations, which I think is really interesting. So just really quickly, these are our conclusions. We've shown that shifts in mimetic coloration can sometimes predict shifts in sensory investment, with that hyperscada anchiala being a really good example. And that this is a really great case of an adaptive evolutionary trait. And sensory investment seems to be positively linked with fly type. And the main goal of all of this is to look across the entire phylogeny of these butterflies and test for mimetic, what sensory convergence as well as sensory divergence. But that's it. Thank you to all these people for helping me along the way and my funders as well. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Benito. Um, I don't think we have time for questions, but uh, put them in the chat. And up next, we have Amanda Franklin. Okay, can you see that? Yep, and we can hear you really well too. Excellent. All right, hey all, um, I'm Laurie Mitchell. I'm a PhD candidate at the Visual Ecology Lab at the University of Queensland. And today I'm gonna to give you a short rundown of one of my thesis chapters that investigated ultraviolet vision in anemone fish. It's a little cool guy there, um, uh, particularly looking at its role in color vision. So I think most of us here know that UV vision is not uncommon across most animal groups. Um, we also know that by UV receptor involvement and signal opponency can contribute to color vision. Theoretically in animals with four receptor types, um, their full gamut of detectable colors can be plotted in a tetrahedral space as shown there. Uh, behavioral evidence shows that uh, with hummingbird, badriga and common goldfish, they can indeed distinguish UV colors within that space, such as UV yellow, UV red and UV blue. Um, however, these to, up to date, um, these investigations have looked at broad differences in color without looking at uh, finer levels of discrimination for UV colors. Um, so their discrimination thresholds. And it's unclear how these thresholds compare to the more commonly tested human visible regions. And understanding this can help further reveal how animals process colors um, outside our percept. So one major reason for this lack of research attention is due to a lack of suitable technologies that um, produce flexible UV stimuli. Um, traditionally, monochromators have been used. Uh, these are fairly cumbersome devices, especially when you're working around aquariums like I do. Um, and they restrict um, testing regimes often to two-way or three-way force choice tests. Uh, so to overcome these challenges of testing in the UV, we developed a five-channel LED display. 
And this was spearheaded by a postdoc in our lab named uh, Dr. Samuel Powell. And so to break down this display, it's got 96 pic uh, pixels. And in each pixel, we have five LEDs. So red, green, blue, violet, and ultraviolet. And it can be programmed using uh, Python code. And so you can pr uh, produce whatever pattern you so desire, um, as well as colors based on controlling the relative output of each of the LEDs. Um, and so you're showing on the right is the spectral radiance profiles of all the um, five LEDs. Uh, the display is housed within a 3D printed waterproof housing uh, with a PTFE screen, so you can have um, nice diffused color mixing. So um, with that, we have our display. What animal should we look at? Well, I decided to look at the false clownfish, um, Ephiprion ocellaris. This is a sister species of um, Nemo. So like anemone, other anemone fishes, they all live in anemones. Um, and they have a fairly complex social behavior with a dominant female um, subordinates and a uh, subdominant male. And so I decided to go with them. Um, so previously I've found that they have uh, multiple cone opsins expressed in the retina, including a UV sensitive SWS1 opsin in the single cones. Um, looking a bit further, I found that they have UV transmissive lenses in the eye and with microspectrophotometry, the presence of at least four cone types. So uh, one UV sensitive single cone and three types of double cone ranging from medium to long wavelength sensitive. So with this information coupled with the fact that their shallow reef habitat has quite a high amount of UV penetrating the water, um, seems quite likely that they would have functional UV vision in the wild. So this new information was then possible to model their color discrimination and using the receptor noise limited model uh, calculated color distances based on receptor contrast stimulated by LED mixed colors. So in brief, the RNL model considers light received by the eye, receptor sensitivities and noise levels to predict discrimination thresholds and assumes that one unit of color distance is equal, equal to a psychophysical threshold of one just noticeable difference. So in other words, the point at which one color is barely distinguishable from another. Um, however, like all models, even the best, uh, it's an oversimplified representation of a complex system and needs verification. And we did just that using a behavioral experiment. So in this experiment, I wanted to uh, test whether anemone fish can discriminate UV contrast and to um, how their discrimination thresholds vary across color space. Um, so myself and a previous honors student in our lab, Amelia Fallon, reward trained anemone fish to pick a target color from a background of gray distractors using an odd one out task that's been previously developed in our lab. And this control for brightness cues by randomly varying the intensity of the distractors above and below the target. Um, so here's a little clip showing a good trial where a fish pecks the blue target, then returns off screen to get a food reward. So we trained and tested a total of 11 anemone fish split into two groups using nine different series of colors. And here they are plotted in the three dimensional color space of the anemone fish. And they ranged in uh, saturation away from a gray distractor loci near the achromatic point. Um, so here zoomed in, you can see uh, the different colors. So we have a blue line, purple line, green, red, and poking out from behind it an orange, UV red, violet green going down towards the medium wavelength sensitive receptor, a line which just changed in UV contrast, and then a UV blue line. So here are the main results from the experiment um, shown in the left hand plots are the mean psychophysical threshold curves as a function of their proportion of correct choice and color distance per color series. Uh, because we lack receptor noise measurements for anemone fish, these are all uh, the color distances are all calculated using an estimated value of 0.15, which seem to provide the best fit out of a range of estimate values. Um, the threshold itself is taken at a 0.5 proportion of correct choices um, to compensate for the large number of distractors we employed. And the highest thresholds we found were for blue and purple, which were 1.5 and 1.4 um, color distance units respectively. And the le uh, least was for violet green, which is only 0.4. Uh, plotting all of these thresholds uh, alongside each other on the right hand side, you can see that 
there were, um, the thresholds for UV colors of UV contrast were consistently lower than their counterparts that did not. So for instance, UV blue versus blue, um, UV red versus red, green versus violet green. And these differences persisted across alternative models that use uh, that calculated color distances using more or less conservative receptor noise values. Um, however, because we presented some color series later than others during the experiment, there is potential for experience effects to have a part in this. So to control for that, we retested a couple of fish per group um, for each series. And then uh, at the end of the experiment, to see if their um, thresholds had shifted at all. For the most part, we found very minor differences. Um, the most notable probably be UV blue and blue, where um, they actually improved slightly. However, the difference between them persisted. Um, the perhaps most interesting was purple. For some reason, their performance depreciated in the reassessment. I'm not quite sure why that is, uh, but if anyone listening has any ideas at the end, perhaps let me know and I'd love to hear them. But anyway, yeah, experience had a minor effect mostly. So it appears that anemone fish can discriminate UV contrast indicating that the uh, UVS cone is likely involved in signal opponency. Um, we also show hints of likely heterogeneity in color space where UV discrimination thresholds were consistently lower, uh, whereas for blue and purple, they seem to be exceptionally higher. Um, moreover, these differences cannot be explained on the basis of the spectral complexity of targets. Um, to illustrate this point, Take, for instance, blue and UV blue. Um, an argument could be made that perhaps a stronger response was evoked by UV blue due to having a broader rece uh, receptor stimulation by the addition of UV. Um, however, you'd expect a similar relationship then for blue, purple, and red, um, but this simply wasn't observed. So what might be the ecological significance of UV vision in anemone fish? What could they be using it for? Um, one could be for improving the efficacy of feeding, so zooplanktivory, and this has indeed been shown in multiple teleos species. Probably most notably of recent times is the, um, the, uh, the larval zebrafish that uses the UV scatter paramecium to take their prey more easily, um, and they can detect predators ba based on a UV dark silhouette. Alternatively, it could be used for communication, and we know this um, from some damselfishes that use UV reflective markings to recognize um, individuals of their species. For anemone fish, this is actually quite a compelling um, use of it because uh, their colors have quite a lot of UV reflectance. Um, secondly, they also have uh, very complex social behavior. Uh, so based on this experiment, not much can really be said on their color vision circuits. Um, for proving tetrachromacy, that would require a bit more in-depth looking at their discrimination maxima and minima, ironically using a monochromator. Um, but uh, in terms of future work, it'd be interesting to compare if we can learn more about their color vision circuits with say those more well-known from Teleos models like zebrafish that seem to have um, fairly interesting UV potency where it's more of a presence or absence effect. So our experiment showed that UV contrast can, appears to confer vividness to targets. Uh, whether this is reflective of an innate preference for UV stimuli is still unclear. Um, this and whether it has importance in aspects of the ecology is something that quite intrigues me. Finally, we demonstrate the usefulness of our LED display in testing animal color vision. Um, this is definitely suitable for testing in other teleos, including those whose color discrimination thresholds have previously been assessed, but not in the UV. Two examples that come to mind are species of Malawi cichlid and female guppy. Um, obviously, this, uh, the usefulness of this board also extends to other species that um, also have UV vision. So thank you for listening. I'd um, like to thank all three of my advisors, as well as other lab members that contributed to this work. And um, also thank you for the organizers of this wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laurie. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions right now. Please ask them in the chat. And otherwise, we're going to move on to uh, Lily Fogg now. Lily, can you share your screen and talk? Yeah, sure. Um, OK. I'll just wait you? for Laurie to. Oh, yeah, hang on. <laughs> um, talk, if you share your screen, it might just uh, go up over his. Yeah, it'll just cancel mm -hmm. his.
the sharing. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Wait, we can see your talk and we can hear you. Go ahead. Cool. And can you see it in presenter view or the slides? It, it's in presenter view right now. Can you switch it to? Um, So uh, display settings, mm -hmm. might be able to switch the screen, change it to mirror settings or duplicate slideshow. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So my name is Louis Fogg and I'm a last final year PhD student at um, the Queensland Brain Institute at the University of Queensland um, in Brisbane, Australia. And I'm going to give a talk entitled Broad Light Cones in Mesopelagic Fish Larvae Suggest a New Developmental Pathway for Vision in Vertebrates. Okay, so let's start with a quick Vision 101. So here's our vertebrate eye. And if we zoom in on the retina, we can see the retinal structure is exceptionally organized with the light entering here and hitting the photoreceptors at the back of the eye. Most fishes and other vertebrates have two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones. So cones normally function in bright or photopic conditions, while rods function in dim or spotopic conditions. And we can use a combination of the two cell types to see in the mesopic or twilight conditions that occur in between. Now we can tell these two cell types apart at both the morphological and the molecular levels. Morphologically, the end of the cone is tapered or cone-shaped, and the end of the rod is cylindrical or rod-shaped. Now, if we look inside the photoreceptor, we find a signaling pathway called the phototransduction cascade that converts light to the electrical signal that we can transmit along our neurons to the brain. This cascade starts with our light sensitive part, the opsin. Now there are five major subclasses of opsins in fishes, each sensitive to a different range of wavelengths of light. But for this talk, all you need to remember is that RH2 in green is usually expressed in cones and RH1 in gray is typically expressed in rods. Now downstream of the opsin, and many other components of the signaling pathway. And each of these is also specific to cones or rods, as indicated by the green or gray text. Now we can use the morphological structure and gene expression of a photoreceptor together to decide whether we call it a rod or a cone. Okay, so now we know that most fishes have two types of photoreceptors, but how do they develop? Well, very generally, when the eye develops, the larvae start with only cones. So morphologically cone-like cells expressing cone-specific genes are what we could call true cones. And they add rods later to make a two-layered retina in matured adults. This classical cone-to-rod pathway is well conserved across vertebrates. Now, the cone-to-rod pathway is well suited to the ecology of shallow water marine fishes, which start their life in the bright upper pelagic ocean in photopic conditions. So bright conditions that normally require cones. And as they get older, they still experience mostly photopic conditions with some mesopic or twilight conditions that normally require both rods and cones. For mesopelagic fishes, for fishes that live between 200 and 1,000 meters are a bit different. We know that adult mesopelagic fishes, like the light fish here, inhabit the dim scotopic deep sea. And accordingly, many have pure rod retinas. Furthermore, the larvae of mesopelagic fishes tend to start life in slightly deeper and therefore dimmer waters that would normally require both rods and cones. So do larval mesopelagic fishes really start with only cones? Or do they follow a different developmental pathway to help them satisfy their more extreme visual demands? So to answer this, I looked at visual gene expression and retinal morphology in the retinas of mesopelagic fishes over development. I looked at three species from different families, a light fish, a lantern fish, and a pearl side. And these three species are particularly interesting as although they experience dimmer conditions than shallow water fishes at all life stages, they have slightly different ecological demands to each other. Lightfish experience like mostly mesopic conditions as larvae and scotopic as adults. Lanternfish experience photopic to mesopic conditions as larvae and scotopic as adults. And the pearl side experiences mostly mesopic conditions as both larvae and adults. So as I mentioned, I looked at three species, but I'll present the lightfish data here in the most detail as it demonstrated the most extreme changes over development. So first I looked at the expression of several visual genes involved in the phototransduction pathway. Now, lightfish larvae expressed exclusively the green sensitive conopsin RH2, while adults expressed only the rhodopsin RH1. 
And this clone to rod transition is carried throughout the phototransduction pathway with larval whitefish only expressing clone cascade genes, such as R3, GNAT2, and PDEC, and adults expressing only those from a rod cascade, such as SAG, GNAT1, and PDEA and B. So the data at the molecular level supports the cone to rod pathway that is typical of marine fishes and other vertebrates. But if you look at the histology, there's a different story. Now, in the adult, we, as expected, we find only morphologically rod-like cells. So we can see in this bright field image, we have cells with long cylindrical outer segments in the photoreceptor layer. And there are other features we can look at too. One of the most common and characteristic of these being the outer segment discs. Cones normally have open continuous discs or rods have closed discs. And if we zoom in on the ultrastructure of the adults on the TEM and the images on the right, we see closed outer segment discs. So adults have typical rod-like cells, aligning well with what we found at the molecular level. But when we looked at the larvae, we also found only rod-like cells. Again, they have long cylindrical outer segments and closed outer segment discs. So both the larvae and the adult have rod-like photoreceptors at the morphological level. So let's put these results together. According to the gene expression, larvae have only cone genes, while adults have only rod genes. But at the morphological level, larvae and adults both only have rod-like cells. So it seems that the larvae have combined the molecular characteristics of cones with the morphology of a rod to make rod-like cones, while adults have only true rods. Deviating from the classical cone to rod pathway means that the visual system of the light fish is well suited to its respective environments at all life stages. So remember that the larvae inhabit these intermediate mesopic conditions represented by this gray bar, and the adults experience dim scotopic conditions represented by this black bar. But what about the other two species which had slightly different ecological demands, the lantern fish and the pearl side? So it turns out that their visual systems also really well match their environments over ontogeny. For our lantern fish, we find evidence for both true cones and rod-like cones in larvae and true rods in adults well matched to the photopic to mesopic conditions experienced by larvae and the scotopic conditions of adults. Finally, we find rod-like cones in the larval pearl side, and we know from another study that adults also have rod-like cones with a small population of true rods. This again is well matched to the mesopic conditions that they experience throughout life. In conclusion, we found a dominance of rod-like cones in the larvae of all three mesopelagic fishes and they seem to represent an adaptation to mesopic conditions. So indeed, it seems that mesopelagic fishes do follow an alternative developmental pathway to match their dimmer ecological demands. Rather than starting with true cones, like most vertebrates, all three mesopelagic fishes had rod-like cones as larvae to match their dimmer environments. Although not many instances have been published, the discovery of rod-like cones is not an unprecedented finding. Their existence was first suggested in snakes by Walls in 1942, and with the advent of advanced genetic technologies was later confirmed. And they've since been discovered in geckos and salamanders, and even the adults of one species of deep sea fish, the pearl side. However, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first discovery of rod-like cones in the larvae of any vertebrate. These findings challenge our understanding of vertebrate visual development and reveal yet another extreme adaptation to life in the deep sea. And that's it. So a special thank you to my primary advisor, Dr. Fanny de Busero, and my associate advisors, Justin and Fab, and to our collaborators, Damatina. And I would also like to acknowledge the facilities and funding that made this work possible. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Lily. Very nice. Uh, if there's any questions, can you uh, put them in the chat? And I'd be happy to read them. We have a couple minutes here. And also, uh, in, while people are, are writing, is um, uh, Manubu, the next speaker, uh, Manubu here. Uh, we weren't able to contact you ahead of time. We might not have a next speaker, so uh, <laughs> people can ask. Uh, oh, wait, maybe we do. No, we do. Okay. All right. But uh, we still have a couple more minutes before we need to start, Manubu. Um, if anyone has any questions for uh, Lily? Actually, can I ask a question for Lily? 
Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> you can expect to find the rod rod like corn in um, like completely knock down our fish that live in shallow water or like fish live in the cave. Um, so there's been no rod like cones discovered in any other teleosts other than the deep sea fish, the adult pearl side. Um, and to my knowledge, there's nothing in caves either. Um, there's in the snakes, um, the rod like cones seem to represent um, an adaptation um, between of switching ecology. So they go from being diurnal to nocturnal. Um, and so that's sort of seems evolutionarily to be the adaptation. Um, so I guess if you could look, if you could find another organism that does that, um, then maybe you would find something similar. Thank you. Great. All right. If there's any more questions, put them in the chat. And now I think we can uh, switch over to uh, um, Nanabu. Nanabu. <laughs> uh, and, and your talk, we can see and we can hear you well. So go ahead. Hey. Thank you. I'm Manabu Beshuwehara from Naga University. Today, I'd like to tell a story that how a fish emit light using a protein with the fish storeroom from its crustacean prey. This novel process shows how a novel trait such as bioluminescence can evolve without genetic acquisition of the responsible gene. So many phenotypes such as coloration, toxicity, and bioluminescence are usually encoded in the genome. But some are acquired from prey items. For example, newt, pufferfish, and so on accumulate tetrodotoxin, which act as neurotoxin for defensive purpose. And many birds, including flamingos, uptake carotenoids from its diet to express such a vivid color. In marine ecosystem, Majority of animals can emit light, but many of them cannot produce the light uh, cannot produce the light emitting molecule. In this case, uh, shown here, uh, it's a cylinder gene molecule. Instead, they obtain luciferin from dietary source. However, luciferase proteins, which catalyze luciferin in the bioluminescent reaction, are taxon specific and encoded in the genomes, as shown here. You can easily see no conserved domain among various luciferases. This suggests that animals have to evolve a new gene to become bioluminescent, and luciferase, luciferase genes are always encoded in its genome. However, I found an exciting exception in the course of studying this fish, Paraplia kansas lansonetii. So let me introduce about the fish. A bioluminescent fish, Parabia canvas lansonetii, has two light organs on the ventral side. One is thoracic light organ and another is anal light organ. It emits light under the dim light condition. When I switch on and off the light, the fish responded immediately and regulate its light intensity to adjust environmental brightness. The ecological law of its bioluminescence might be counter-illumination, which cancel out, cancel out its share wet, may, uh, made by downward sunlight or moonlight for camouflage shadow. And for the, about the principle of bioluminescent reaction, light emitting reaction in animals involves luciferin and luciferase protein. In case of vagular Hilgendorfii, vagurin molecule it's catalyzed by vagular luciferase to emit light. Only one old study had been performed to understand biochemistry of luminescence in this fish about 60 years ago. In 1985, Haneda found that enzymatic extraction prepared, enzyme extraction prepared from light organs of this fish reacted with luciferin extract of vagular hirgendorphia to produce light and vice versa. This result suggests that the fish uses the same luciferin molecule of crustacean to, for the bioluminescence. Soon after, vagrin was identified from the fish and 
pyloric seeker and the intestine shows the fluorescence and the UV light suggesting the occurrence of vagurin. However, the luciferase enzyme of this fish had not been identified. Although there are a lot of luminous fish in the ocean, no fish luciferase gene have been identified. So originally I set my research goal to identify the fish luciferase in, in this, uh, using this fish, Parapia cancer transplanted. So firstly, I extracted protein from the fish light organ and the purified luciferase based on luminescent activity using chromatography techniques. In general, after amino acid sequence, we go forward to gene cloning. But I found what's surprising, which I'm showing in the next slide. The purified luciferase was fragmented by trips in digestion and analyzed to sequence amino acid using mass spectrometry. And the detected peptides are searched in the transcriptome database of the fish, but no significant candidate were found. Then the peptides were searched against the NCBI database to identify the protein. And surprisingly, I found that the purified luciferase of fish was identical to the luciferase of other crustacean, Cypridina noctirica. So this little crustacean, Cypridina, is closely related to Vagira, Hirigendorfii, and also uses Vagirin molecule to emit light. And based on our experiment, Parapria Kansas fish has luciferin and luciferase, which are identical to crustacean cypheridina. And luciferin, small molecule, are known to be passed through predation, as I showed you before. However, protein site, luciferase uptake have not been known in any animal. To, to confirm that finding, we then compared luminescent spectra of Parapia Kansas and Sapridina. The bioluminescent spectra of Parapia Kansas was uh, showing blue curve was identical to that of Sapridina noctilica. And the luciferase, acti ac luciferase activity using vagurin was detected only in thoracic and anal light organs, but not in non-luminous tissues such as pyrolexica, intestine, and muscles. By Western blotting experiment, immune reactivity was also detected only in the light organs. Next, the luciferase was visualized by immunohistological technique using the anti cypridina luciferase antibody with the RX488 Houston secondary antibody. And green signals indicate luciferin localization, uh, luciferase localization and it's found only in the light organ covered, in the, covered with the black reflectors in this picture. So based on these experiments, now I hope you agree that cypridina luciferase is in the fish light organ. And but how? The question is, but how? So attribution of bacterial symbionts or horizontal gene transfer are unlikely, although I did some experiment, so the alternative hypothesis is uptake protein from the dietary source. In nature, Parapia cancer swim up to the surface of ocean at night and feed on zooplankton, such as Cypheridina noctirca and other shrimps. But the fish do not eat, do not eat Vagira because those crustaceans live in the sun. So to test this hypothesis, we kept Parapia Kansas in the aquarium tank without feeding non-luminous prey item. At the time we caught the fish from the ocean, from the wild, the light organ of this fish contains luciferase of cypridina. And time by time, luciferase activity in the fish light organ decreases. After one year, the activity is less than 1% of fresh trip caught fish. And when we fed Vagra Hugendorfi on these fish, which first activity in the light organ was recovered after two weeks. And using those specimens, the first extract from the Vagra fed specimen was then purified and sequenced 
and 18 unique peptides unique to vagular luciferase were detected. And this suggests uptake of dietary luciferase. Based on those results, we provide evidence that parapel cancer fish obtain both luciferase small molecule and luciferase protein I'm from dietary. Yeah. Oh, one, one minute. With maintaining its original function. No, no, sorry, you're fine. No, that was someone without a muted mic. You have uh, three minutes left. So, unlike uptake of small organic compounds, protein uptake is surprising because ingested protein is usually digested and decomposed into small peptides and amino acids, resulting in the loss of the original protein function. So sequestering a function module is known in some other organisms, such as cryptoplasticity and cryptonidism, cryptonidid in sea slugs, which steals the chloroplast for uh, photosynthesis or uh, steals the nidocyte for the defensive function or um, offensive function. So according to those instances, we named this phenomenon found in the fish as creptoprotein, meaning steering protein. Creptoprotein is a novel process to obtain a new function by sequestering protein with maintaining its original function is instead of a canonical DNA gene evolution. So I think protein might be found in uh, simple phenotypes, such as bioluminescence, fluorescence, or coloration, or related to living life, this conference topic. So if you couldn't identify the responsible genes or proteins, when you study those, those phenom phenomena. So please remember uh, my study, protein. Finally, right, uh, I would like to thank you for watching and thank those people, especially for the aquarists. If you get interested in crypto protein, bioluminescence, or its evolutions, please follow my Twitter account, or uh, I'm happy to get email directly for the questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a, a beautiful talk. Um, I think we need to move right into the next one, though. So if anyone has any questions, please put them into the chat or to contact um, him by Twitter. So our next presenter is uh, Jasper John Stead. Are, are you here, Jasper? Yep, I'm here. All right. And can you share your screen, please? Mm -hmm. You see that, Pauline? Yes, we can now. Thank Great. you. Go ahead. All right. So, hi, I'm Jasper. I'm an honors student with the Sensory Neurobiology Group at the uh, Queensland Brain Institute. And my presentation is about the deep sea and the brains of lanternfish. So, the deep sea is pretty cool. It's a very extreme environment that has led to the evolution of many strange and uniquely adapted animals. A couple of examples are the telescope fish that has tubular eyes that improve its ability to spot bioluminescent prey, the anglerfish that exhibits some of the most extreme and unsettling sexual dimorphism and sexual reproduction in the animal kingdom, with this here being the male attached to the female, which is many times its size, and the whalefish that uh, shows such massive sexual dimorphism and larval transformations that it was originally classified as three different fish until the advent of molecular methods. So needless to say, the deep sea has led to some very strange and extraordinary adaptations. The lanternfish are a deep sea fish. They're one of the largest and most abundant families of deep sea fish that live in the mesoplagic, which is also known as the twilight zone of the ocean, which has decreasing downwelling sunlight with depth and the upper bed for the pelagic, which there is no sunlight, only bioluminescence and uh, migratory species that sometimes uh, migrate to the surface of the ocean at night to feed. They're all bioluminescent, so they have like, absolutely covered in different bioluminescent spots, bioluminescent patches, uh, bioluminescent organs and photophores, which are used in counter-illumination. 
The visual system of the lanternfish has been studied extensively by my supervisor, Dr. Fanny de uh, who identified an extreme level of diversity in the retinal structure and eye size, as well as pigmentation and all sorts of other levels of the visual system. She also found that there was sexual dimorphism in the eyes of some of the mycophid species, as well as the relationship between retinal density and depth. Furthermore, she noticed that there were several lanternfish that lacked any kind of visual specialization, meaning that they must rely on another sense. To see if we can identify these other senses and to further investigate the visual system and look for other relationships between depth and ecological factors, we looked at the brains of the lanternfish. This is because the relative size of different brain areas in an animal is indicative of the importance of the function of that brain area to the animal. The olfactory bulb yeah, mediates olfaction. The optic tect tectum mediates vision. The crista cerebelli mediates mechanosensation, which includes the lateral line, auditory, and some other sensory systems of the animal. There are also several key integration areas which we analyzed. These include the telencephalon, which is involved in processing information for, which is what's thought to be involved in processing information for social behavior and spatial recognition the corpus cerebellum, which is involved in fast and complex movement and integrates sensory inputs with motor outputs, and the diencephalon, which is a major integration center that receives projections from all across the brain and projects all across the brain. To look at these brain areas in uh, lanternfish, we dissected the brains of 138 uh, specimens from 56 species and 20 genera, and estimated the volumes of each brain area using the ellipsoid method. We then estimated the volumes of the whole brain using uh, its total brain mass, and then compared these using phylogenetic comparative analysis of PGLS. Did this to compare the size of different brain regions across species while accounting for phylogeny, and then attempt to see if there are any ecological factors such as bioluminescence or depth that could predict the brain area sizes. What we found was an amazing diversity in brain morphology, which can be seen in these photos here. This extended to even very closely related species. In fact, the bottom four images here are all species from the same genus, the genus Diaphus. And you can see amazing morphological differences between them, even though they're incredibly closely related. This graph shows the residuals of a PGLS model of brain area size versus the size of the rest of the brain. This gives us an indication of the relative size and therefore relative importance of each brain region and indicates whether the animal has a preference for olfaction, the olfactory bulb, vision with the optic tectum, or mechanosensation, the crystal cerebellum. You can see that uh, across the phylogeny, different genus of lanternfish have very clear preferences for different senses. With some like these here, preferencing mechanosensation with enlarged crystal cerebelli. Some like Caphrixes and Electrona showing clear preferences for vision, and some like Gymnoscopellus and Lampadina that show clear preferences for olfaction. Others here are more mixed. We also found that there's a very strong negative correlation between the size of the optic tectum and the crystal cerebellum. This is, is an important because uh, this suggests that there's a very clear distinction between lanternfish that are specialized for vision. For enlarged optic tectums and those specialized for mechanosensation with enlarged crystal cerebellum. The diversity even extended to within a single genre, diaphus, which I showed you before, because it shows a remarkable degree of variability in all its brain regions, which you can see on this graph here, which is showing the same thing as the graph before, except across all six brain regions that we studied and across all the species of diaphus. Particularly notable is the variation in the size of the cerebellum, which is in light blue here. You can see that in some diaphor species, it's very small, while in others, it gets to be extremely large, in fact, even unprecedentedly large for a teleost fish. You can see it on these MRIs too, with cross-section of regular diaphor versus one with a large cerebellum, such as diaphor lucidus here, which when you look on the graph, isn't even the biggest that we have. We also found that bioluminescence of the animal could predict the size of some brain areas. 
the presence of luminous patches predicted an enlarged T on Kepler. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why this is yet, uh, because no one really knows what the luminous patches on lanternfish are used for. But my current theory is that the teal and Kepler is used in social behavior, which may indicate that the luminous patches are used in communication. The presence of a luminous head organ predicted an enlarged cerebellum. Once again, I don't really know why this is, but uh, my theory for this is that the cerebellum is typically enlarged in predatory species. So it would make sense that the head organ of the lanternfish may be used as a lamp to help it find its prey. So to summarize, we found an incredibly great diversity in brain morphology, similar to the visual system of the lanternfish, and identified clear visual, olfactory, and mechanosensory specialists across the phylogeny. We observed high variability in uh, the specializations of the animal, even at a genus level, and identified an uh, inverse relationship between the optic tectum and crystal cerebellum size. Furthermore, we identified the presence of bioluminescent tissue predicts brain morphology. We also found a couple more relationships with bioluminescence and brain morphology, but I decided to not include them uh, due to time. So what we've still got to do in this is further MRI analysis. You might have noticed I had the MRIs before and we intend to conduct these on across 10 species of note with three relationships for species at least, and then rerun our PGLS analysis. The reason that we're gonna do this is because the ellipsoid estimate that we use to uh, calculate the volume of each brain area is only an estimate and it has a couple of limitations. So we wanna confirm our findings with some MRI, which gives us a much more accurate volume estimate. What we expect from previous studies is that whilst we will get different volume estimates from the MRIs, the relationships between the species and with the ecological factors should be conserved. We also intend to use the MRI to look at some of the internal structures, such as the valvular cerebellum that you can see here and the optic uh, tegmentum that you can see here that we wouldn't be able to analyze otherwise with the lipsoid method, which is limited to seeing photos of the external parts of the brain. So I'd like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Penny Dippus Rolls, as well as Dr. Kara Yopak for helping me put this together and this project, as well as the rest of the Marshall Lab for their support for this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasper. If there's any uh, questions, uh, please write them in the chat. Um, we have, I think, two minutes uh, for questions here. We've got one question here from uh, Jerome. Uh, uh, he says, any thoughts about interspecific brain size variations, different populations at different depths in some species, sex specific in relation to sex specific luminous patterns? Yeah, so um, we looked at uh, variations in brain size with um, uh, depth patterns and brain area size with depth patterns. Um, we found that there might be a relationship between the size of the dying kephalon and uh, depth with deeper species having a larger dying kephalon, but it's not like not entirely sure on it yet. Um, we've got to do a little bit more investigation into that. And aside from that, there was no relationships of depth. There was no relationships of brain size and depth. There was no relationships of any other brain area size and depth. Like we were looking for a relationship potentially between the visual system and the optic tectum and depth, but there was absolutely nothing was interesting to find. And in terms of sex specific patterns, we looked at sexual dimorphism uh, in the lanternfish and brain size and brain area size. And there was no relationship between different brain areas and sexual dimorphism, but there is a potential relationship between sexual dimorphism and brain size, but we're still not entirely, like the stats are kind of weird and messy on that. And so I got to look into the analysis of that a bit better before I give any conclusive findings on that. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jasper. Um, next, we're going to be uh, moving on to the flash presentation. So I will share uh, a screen with the presentations on it, hopefully. And uh, we've had one, one of the people has uh, dropped out. So we only actually have three flash presenters. And we said you could have two minutes each. But since we 
uh, have only three, we can do three minutes each. So you can slow down a little bit if uh, if you'd like while you're giving this uh, talk. Great. <laughs> Be a little bit less hectic. So our first person up is uh, Manuela, uh, Sophie Briolat. Are, are you here? Hi. Hi. Yeah. Can okay. you hear me? We can hear you. And let right. me move to your slide. Is this yours? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yep, that's me. So, all right. So uh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Hi everyone. I'm I'm just going to briefly introduce some of my research on the effects of artificial lighting on the visual ecology of hawk moss. The light pollution is this growing anthropogenic change that affects both the intensity and the color of light at night and has many ecological impacts. And here we were interested in understanding how artificial lighting can change visual perception for a species that has really excellent nighttime color vision, um, this elephant hawk moth. And particularly looking at three aspects of its visual ecology, how moths might perceive the flowers they pollinate, how they might view each other's wing patterns and how potential predators might see them as well. So to do this, we combine information on the spectral sensitivities of hawk moss and the blue tit as a model bird with emission spectra from various light sources and reflectance values from plants and hawk moss specimens. And then with low light visual modeling, we calculated contrast between relevant colors under the different lights in conditions from twilight to starlight. The general approach was always to compare visual contrast under artificial lights to what you would get under moonlight or a natural light source of a similar light level to see if artificial lights actually helped or hindered detection. So for hawk moss, we found that lights generally had three types of effects. Either they supported vision similarly to moonlight, or they could block color vision, or there was this third more variable pattern that depends on the intensity of the light and the colors viewed. So we can just have a look at these plots that show contrast between vegetation and flowers to see roughly these three trends. So compared to moonlight shown in black, Lights like mercury vapor in purple always provide similar or higher contrast than moonlight. Um, Narrowband orange lights in red and orange consistently yield contrast that are below the threshold for discrimination. So moss can't see those color contrasts under those lights. And finally, with lights like PC amber LEDs in yellow and brown, contrast for pink flowers are similar to moonlight at high light levels, but then much lower than those um, in darker conditions. So these PC amber LEDs lack the typical blue peak of white LEDs, so they're generally thought to be less harmful for wildlife because blue light is typically very attractive. But they actually might have some complex effects on how species like hawk moss see the world. So perhaps we need a bit more research into those before rolling them out on a wide scale. Um, so in general, we hope that this kind of modeling can help make more accurate predictions about what moss see at night um, and um, inform ideas of the potential impacts of light pollution. Um, and if you want more details on any of the methods or the other results, you can take a look at our paper that's just out. Um, and otherwise, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please write them in chat or, uh, or contact uh, Emanuela uh, out, right. outside of the session. Uh, thank you very much, beautiful talk. And uh, the next person up will be Abigail Shaughnessy. And uh, can we hear you, Abigail? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'll move to your slide now. And is that it? Yep, okay. Uh, you have three minutes, go ahead. Perfect. Hi, I'm Abby, and we've been looking at the visual system of the boxfish. Now, as many of us know, different animals have various number of spectral sensitivities. While most coral reef fish have between two to four spectral sensitivities, the white spotted boxfish Omeliagris has been identified through microspectrophotometry to have five. However, it's actually unclear how information from five independent color channels is processed and whether this is actually translated into improved color discrimination. So we looked at the visual system of two species of boxfish, um, the cute little yellow boxfish, Ossicum cubicus, and then also the white spotted boxfish, Ossicum eliagris. Um, high throughput RNA sequencing allowed us to identify and determine the expression of their options, and we found that they had one violet sensitive SWS2B, one blue green sensitive RH2A, and a green sensitive RH2B. And the expression of these options was actually similar between the two species of boxfish. Um, so to see if the number of spectral sensitivities of Ocubicus actually improves their visual performance, we compared their vision to a previously tested trichromatic triggerfish, Rhinocanthus aculatus. We used a detection test involving a dot that was either green, gray, or blue in color, um, and they had to detect that against the 
um, pick the dot against the gray background. And we decrease the saturation of the dot, making it harder for the fish to see. And the boxes are actually better at detecting the color green and gray compared to the triggerfish. However, for the blues, they were about the same. Um, we also use fluorescent in situ hybridization to see if perhaps co-expression of the optin was creating um, intermediate spectral sensitivities and whether if this was the reason that they actually had improved achromatic discrimination. However, we actually couldn't find any co-expression between the RHQA and the RHQB in the double cones across any parts of the retinal. So in conclusion, we actually found that our molecular analysis doesn't line up with the MSP data. But it was interesting to find that Opubicus, according to our molecular analysis, is likely to have the three spectral sensitivities, while their sister species, um, Omeliagris, um, has five. And this difference may be because of the different ecological or visual demands that each species encounters. But it's important to note that the MSP measurement alone, perhaps, is without having molecular and behavior knowledge, can perhaps lead to misconceptions about the visual system and the way that an animal perceives their environment. So further assessing the visual performance of Omeliagris and looking perhaps for co-expression within their retina could further unravel the questions we have about the spectral sensitivities of the boxfish visual system. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. That was a very nice talk. Um, you're, please uh, send questions in chat for Abigail. And otherwise we need to move on to the next person who is uh, Zara Moradinor. Um, are you, uh, can we uh, hear you? Yes. yes, we can hear you. And now I will move to your slide and you have uh, three minutes and go ahead. Perfect, thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Zahra Moradinur. I'm a PhD student at Stockholm University working with Emily Baird and her research team. Uh, currently we are trying to understand the effect of elevated temperature uh, on eye size and visual performance in butterflies during development. Um, so far, we know that butterflies are day active uh, insects and uh, they are rely on their vision to successfully forage in their habitat. We also know that uh, larger eyes provide better visual sensitivities, thus um, better visual performances. And um, it has been shown that uh, male butterflies uh, have been better at uh, mate finding competition uh, with larger eyes and female better at finding host plants. Um, what we don't know, however, is that how the eye size in butterflies might be affected by the elevated temperature during developmental process. Um, so uh, the graph on the uh, right is our preliminary results to address this question by showing the relationship between eye size and body size from males and females uh, of butterflies Pieris nepi that has been uh, raised into different temperature treatments, one from 32, which is a higher temperature, and 23 as a control temperature. Um, it is very surprising that we found that the eye size in females uh, have been actually um, growing in size with body size, but only in females, and more surprisingly, uh, we haven't found any changes for uh, males' eye size in butterflies. Um, so uh, it is um, very interesting results, um, but uh, even though we haven't found any negative impacts on the uh, higher temperature on the overall eye size in butterflies, we are still interested to uh, see how the facet size and facet density might be changed with the uh, elevated temperature and uh, how after this would affect on the visual behavior on the butterflies. Thank you for your listening and I'm happy to answer your question in the chat. Thank you very much, uh, Zara. Um, I think, yeah, that's all we have for flash presentations. We have a couple minutes before the next uh, one starts. So if anyone has any questions in chat, uh, please uh, write them in for the flash presenters, any of them. Uh, and otherwise, our next person is going to be uh, Pramosh. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen. We have and... about three minutes. Oh, we do that much. OK. Yeah, yeah you're right. OK. so. We'll uh, we'll wait three minutes, <laughs> a break, and then uh, you can really have... fast bathroom break or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I just want to say I'm always astonished at how much can be fit into two or three minutes worth of time. So I think it's really great <laughs> to <laughs> hear all the flash talks and how much you can fit in there. So well done, everyone. Yep. And um, just a reminder uh, for you guys, after this uh, session, we have uh, three more talks left. Uh, after that, uh, there will be some closing remarks out in the main session. And we're also going to present uh, several awards for best talks and best uh, flash presentations. Uh, so if you stick around for five, 10 minutes after the uh, last talk out in the main session, uh, you'll be able to see that, see who wins. And it's going to be a, a tough five minutes to figure out who won. <laughs> Had a lot of excellent uh, talks and flash presentations these last two days. But otherwise, I think uh, we can get going on uh, Primosh's talk. Uh, so we can hear you and we can cool. see your presentation. Good. So take it away, Primosh. Uh, good evening, everybody, or whichever time zone you're in. I'm going to be talking, in a way, continuing from where Gregor has left us early in our morning, but going a little bit more in the optical direction. It's going to be about butterflies and their vision. Uh, so, just a brief uh, reminder that uh, butterflies have apposition eyes which are slightly different from the, uh, from the, from, from the, for instance, those from the flies because they have a focal optics. They have a fused rhabdom and the rhabdom itself is tiered, uh, which means uh, that there are nine cells and they have their rhabd rhabdomeric parts are at different levels, particularly the basal cell R9 is really just down at the bottom. Um, so, uh, because there is also a tapetum at the bottom, at the basal lamina, which you can see here on the left, uh, the, the butterflies are actually neatly adorned with a phenomenon called the eye shine. And for that, uh, you actually don't need a very expensive microscope. Uh, you can build one your own. Uh, and uh, once you have it, you can actually also take this out of pictures with the mobile phone. Uh, so uh, if uh, you put water on the cornea, the waveguides, which are in the butterfly, uh, which are the butterfly rhabdoms can actually neatly appear here. This is the morpho. And these uh, blue blobs around are actually not the light reflected from the, uh, from the rhabdoms back, but it's actually some sort of fluorescent pigment, which is present in some omotidia. The omotidial eye shine can be really apart from being very nice to look at, it's also very diverse. Here on the left, uh, on the bottom, we have uh, 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 the angled sunbeam, which just has a nice orange uh, non-mosaic non type of eye shine. Then we have another lacinic, which has this red omatidia. And then we have uh, a, a case of a satyrin, which has a just a nice green uh, yellowish eye shine. And on the right, we have a fritillary, again, with a nice mosaic of uh, red and uh, yellow omatidia. Just a reminder that uh, probably the most studied butterfly papilio, unfortunately, does not have an eye shine. So we lose a great tool to study them, but there is also not a, a lot of other tools that can be used there. So unfortunately, the eye shine is not with us to stay for much longer after we have actually shown the light on the eye because it disappears and it disappears due to the action of the pupil. The pupil response is due to calcium induced uh, pigment migration and the calcium influx is due to the cell, uh, the photoreceptor itself being depolarized. So what one can observe then is uh, that the eye shine intensity 
changes it falls down to 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 dark but also its shape of of each individual umatidial eye shine is changing and this is due to due to the action of of the of the pupillary pigments which uh first suppress the second uh, waveguide modes and only at the end uh the central the the, the fundamental mode so there are a few important points at this, uh, uh, just for you to 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 to, uh, to to take to the second part of the talk. First, that the pupil is activated independently in individual photoreceptors. That the pupil is actually distal because it's uh, close to the uh, it's, it's it's residing close to the, the dioptric apparata. And as a consequence of that, the pupil sensitivity spectrum of each particular matidium is in a way a weighted sum of the distal sensitivities of the nine photoreceptors which are in each matidium. So this gives uh, rise to a technique called uh, the optical retinography, uh, ORG, and we can actually just in a way say that it's an ERG on steroids. So it can measure from 600 or maybe even 1,000 uh, individual units. So the way how this looks is the following. So in the case of the um, angled sunbeam, the Lysini that I have shown with the orange eye shine before, the dark adapted eye shine taken at 600 nanometers looks pretty uniform. But uh, if we pre-adapt uh, the eye with um, uh, the ultraviolet light, about half of the omatidia actually go dark and a uh, half remain quite bright. So these are the omatidia that did not react to the UV light. Then if we actually, uh, if we take uh, blue light, then maybe a little bit less profoundly, but there you can actually still see that there is another type of mosaic appearing here. So these are materia which remain bright here are those that did not react to the blue light. In the case of the Red Admiral Vanessa, uh, we actually uh, found that there are three types of materia which are now here uh, shown as uh, yellow, uh, pink and blue, and they depict uh, the materia in which the vertical cells R1 and 2 are either UV and blue both U, uh, UV or both blue. So these are the pupillary spectra um, uh, shown for um, uh, for this about 300 tomatid in the upper two groups and uh, about 15 in the lower group. And you can actually see that the first one has three peaks, UV, blue and green, and uh, then uh, uh, UV and blue uh, and green and blue and green. And then uh, the other lines are actually showing how does the pupillary response change if you change the, uh, the polarization uh, of, uh, of the stimulus or if you actually bleach the eye before. Uh, so with this data, uh, we were able to map the mosaic uh, to, uh, uh, back, to, back to the eye and we figured out there's with this 10% of, of blue blue matidia. For those who know about the spineless gene, this should actually relate to about uh, the expression level of about one third of the spineless. Now the technique how we actually obtain this uh, is um, by recording the 600 or so matidia. Um, these are actually already listed here as this uh, gray waterfalls, but they're already ordered. And the way how we order them is that we actually perform singular value decomposition on this spectra that we had before, and then we cluster them. So in the case of Vanessa, uh, there are really like three nice groups of materia that pop out in this way. Uh, and these are then mapped back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the mosaic. So uh, if I go to the, to, the, to the paper kite from Okinawa, which is a denied butterfly. Um, so this one has uh, a non-uniform eye shine and there are, there's, there's a number of red omatidia, especially in the center in the ventral part of the eye. And that those red omatidia are due to the presence of uh, a longitudinal uh, red pigment. And the persimony, uh, if we if we keep the persimony, would actually say that probably one of these three types of uh, of the omatidia should have the pigment. I performed the singular value decomposition again here, and uh, you may think that this is actually a little bit forced that I have uh, uh, divided this into six clusters. Uh, so this would be the 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 appropriate um, uh, retinal mo mosaic map for that. Uh, but actually those uh, six groups are related to the colors of the omatidia that we have found. So uh, the, in reality for the paper kite says that there are three red and three yellow omatidial types. So if we look at uh, omatidial uh, pupillary uh, response spectra for the yellow omatidia, we have uh, the left group is UV-UV. Uh, the, uh, the, the one on the right is uh, uh, 
blue blue for the vertical cells and the middle one is the combined is the uv blue for the vertical cells now in the red omatidia the situation is the following uh, the central one is actually a very strange one so this one you can see that uh, that the the responses to the uh, doors uh, to the to the vertically horizontally and diagonally polarized light the pupillary response was the same in all three cases and the best explanation for this is that uh, here both uh, so both vertical cells are actually the same green as those that are horizontal the remaining two groups are most likely uh, showing uh, uh, having uh, uv and green and respectively blue and green uh, in the vertical positions um, if we move on to the two-tailed Pasha, uh, this one has even maybe a more interesting eye shine because there are yellow, red, and green omatidia. And uh, when we boosted the channels of the camera, we actually, we were able to see that some omatidia appear then a little bit blue. Uh, again, by doing singular valid decomposition uh, on this 600 or 700 uh, omatidial pupillary spectra, and together with this, also taking the omatidial color into, into, uh, into account, we were able to, again, define six types of, uh, of omatidia. And th there would be like three groups that would, uh, that would have green eye shine, two groups that would have a red eye shine, and one that, that, that would have a blue eye shine. Now, if we look at the uh, pupillary response spectra here, uh, we can see that the two groups uh, that have the red eye shine, these are these two, actually also have a response of the pupil which is prolonged or extended to the red. So in Haraxas, the red omatidia have a red extended pupil sensitivity. Uh, using another technique, uh, so, uh, so uh, her, uh, this, is, this is how the eye shine looks uh, when it's dark adapted. That's the picture on the left. And that's the way how it moves uh, towards green when, you, uh, when it gets light adapted. But actually, this light adaptation is not the one due to the pupil, but is due to due to the to the photochemical change from rhodopsin to metarhodopsin. Now, if we measure this with spectrometer, um, we can actually see that uh, that the blue part, the, the blue reflection, goes down, whereas the re reflection in the orange red part goes up. And uh, that actually, the first two seconds of this change is due to the photochemical relaxation and the rest from two seconds to 12 to 10 seconds or so is due to the closure of the pu closure of the pupil uh, now this first part the, the photochemical relaxation can be uh, can be actually used to predict uh, or to estimate the rhodopsin and, and uh, the, the pair of rhodopsin and metarhodopsin for the main uh, visual pigment in the eye and in the case of the of the two-tailed pasha this uh, is estimated to be kind of lime uh, so the rhodopsin peaks at 545 and metrodopsin at about 500 nanometers. Now, if we take this data together uh, and uh, by also taking the measured spectrum of this red pigment that I've shown before, we can have uh, we can actually have a, a two-pass model uh, of the rhabdom, which is uh, not taking into account any waveguide effects or something like this. But by using uh, um, one uh, opsin at 520 and one at 545, and by using this orange uh, longitudinal pigment, we can predict the spectral sensitivities that are actually um, uh, ascribed then to the photoreceptors R1 and 2. This is the green curve here, the R3 to 8, which is the yellow curve here, and the basal R9, which is the red curve here. Now, this uh, rainbow plot in the background is actually showing you which wavelengths are, uh, are absorbed by which pigment. So the green one is uh, this this blob here is actually showing the what is being absorbed by R1 and R2. The blue blob here is showing you what is uh, what is being absorbed by R3 to 8. The orange blob here is showing you the action of the of the screening pigment, and the red blob here is what is the is the said remains uh, that actually are uh, available to the basal photoreceptor. You have uh, a minute left, Pramosh. Okay. Um, I just wanted to show you that um, the pigment in the silver wash filter, this red pigment, this was a big surprise for us now, is not only in these four spots, which are in the, at, the, at the top part, at the distal part of the of, of the of the omatidia, but there's actually also spots in the in the in the basal part, these two spots which would be actually uh, in the 
in the cells, in the horizontal cells, R3 to 4. Uh, so these are the spots here. Uh, that's the fluorescence. And these are the, this is the normal bright field microscopy, which shows you that these two uh, pigment spots are in R3 and 4. So uh, proximal rest critic pigment in the case uh, of uh, the fritillary is actually in three and uh, in the cells three and four. And its function seems to be that it achieves the sensitivity of R9 from pink to red. Uh, I'm going to skip a few things now uh, and just get to um, my uh, thanks uh, and uh, to my take home message, which is that uh, butterflies can have more than three omotidial types. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, beautiful talk. Uh, we don't have uh, questions, uh, time for questions right now. So uh, you can uh, send questions to Primos in chat. Uh, we're going to move right on to Amy Streets, who is the next presenter. Um, can we hear you, Amy? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. And can you share your screen? Yes, I can. Hopefully. Oops, sorry. All right, looks like it's starting to share. All right, uh, you can see right, your screen. Uh, okay. You can see and we can hear. All right, great. Hi, um, I'm Amy Streets, uh, Dr. Amy Streets as of about two weeks ago, and I am from the Marshall Lab at the University of Queensland. And I'm going to present one of my thesis chapters, uh, which was on the vision of mantis shrimp. And this is about, um, this chapter was about how they interpret color information. So there's been a couple mantis shrimp talks already. Um, mantis shrimp have very complex eyes. Uh, they have three regions of their eyes, a dorsal and ventral hemisphere, which are pretty similar to other um, insects and crustaceans as well. But what makes them different is that they have this central midband, which is uh, six rows of enlarged omatidia. The first four rows specialize in color vision and the last two rows in circular polarization vision. So can I do this laser pointer? All right, so for these first four color, for these four color rows, they are separated into tiers. So you have a top tier, which is uh, sensitive to ultraviolet light, uh, middle tier, which is sensitive to, and then middle and bottom tiers, which are sensitive to um, vi uh, visual light. So red to violet. Um, so three, Three tiers in four rows means 12 spectral sensitivities. They're all narrow band. And um, quite frankly, this is a silly amount of spectral sensitivities. But um, as others have mentioned before, they have relatively poor color discrimination. So a previous experiment by, uh, from our lab in 2014 showed that stomatopods actually we're not really able to tell similar wavelengths apart very well. Um, and this is different from a modeled opponent system that would just be a serial dichromatic system. So like comparing each of the uh, tiers within a row. But this poor spectral discrimination shows that um, unlike most animals which use an opponent system to interpret color information, uh, mantis shrimp are not doing this. So what are they doing? Um, well, there was a previous paper from 96 that had, uh, it was like the first uh, paper showing uh, color vision in mantis shrimp. So they, these peacock mantis shrimp were tasked to pick colored blocks from gray. And they were pretty good at this task. Um, they were able to choose the red, green, and yellow from chance um, quite well, but they had a little bit of trouble with this blue stimulus. Um, and when uh, they looked at the uh, actual spectrum of the blue stimulus, it, it turned out that it was kind of broad. It was a, like a broadband uh, stimulus or a low saturation. And so that when, they, when you model the response of each of these photoreceptor tiers, so each photoreceptor type, um, while like the other uh, stimuli like the red and the green had a sort of unique signature, like a unique barcode, the green, the blue was quite similar to the gray. So the sort of most photoreceptor types were activated by this blue stimulus, 
um, very similar to how the gray was activated, which led to um, this uh, barcode hypothesis or binning hypothesis, uh, where the, amount, the pattern of uh, photoreceptor activation would, um, would be like an explanation for the mantis shrimp color vision in that they would treat the wavelengths separately as if they only saw 12 wavelengths and didn't compare them. And so these are the two major hypotheses. Uh, opponency uh, within rows, which uh, the 2014 experiment showed that that's likely not the only way mantis shrimp are interpreting color information, but, and then this uh, barcode hypothesis. And so this is the one that I sort of explored in my experiments. Um, so we took uh, high and low saturation colors. So this low saturation blue is similar to the one that was used in the 96 experiment. And you sort of see these high saturation colors uh, in the solid lines are um, sort of reflecting only a small amount of wavelengths, whereas the low saturation colors reflect over quite a few wavelengths. And when this is plotted, again, these high saturation colors have a unique barcode and the low saturation sort of activate all of the photoreceptors and may be more similar to gray. And what we expected is that the mantis shrimp would not be able to distinguish these low saturation colors from gray based on those uh, results of the 96 experiment. So this is an example of one of the experiments. There's a one color and two distractor cable ties with little filters on them. Mantis shrimp comes out, he's looking around, having a little think. And then he grabs one and pulls it back. And that is a successful choice. So these are the results of the experiment. Um, they were actually able to learn all of the colors pretty well. Um, the only thing was, is that in red, orange, and blue, and most of the colors, they were actually more successful at distinguishing the low saturation colors from gray. And this is sort of the opposite of what we expected. Um, but I, uh, we did notice that some of these high saturation colors, the mantis shrimp uh, often had issues learning these colors. Um, and so what I decided to do was do a, another experiment of performance over time to see the effect of staying in the, of living in artificial light in the lab for a while. Um, so this first bar in these graphs, the, the dark bar, that is a week um, in the field under natural lighting. And then the second bar is the first 10 weeks in the lab under artificial lighting and the second 10 weeks in the lab under artificial lighting. And it's pretty obvious the mantis shrimp sort of lose uh, color vision capabilities while in the lab after about two months. And this could be for any number of factors, uh, it's likely a combination of loss of motivation, maybe um, not enough uh, certain proteins and uh, nutrients in their diets, um, many things. But um, that likely accounts for this poor uh, performance in these high saturation colors, as well as the um, inability of the peacock mantis shrimp in the 96 experiment to distinguish the blue stimulus because those animals have been in the lab and under artificial lighting for much longer. I also did uh, naive choice tests to figure out maybe, maybe they're avoiding certain colors. Um, what I found though that they, they did seem to prefer red and avoid green, uh, but they didn't really care so much about the blue and the orange and those are the ones they had trouble with in the experiment. Um, so it, it is likely because of the uh, and the artificial lighting in the lab that they had the poor performance. I also did other uh, naive choice tests with just the uh, low saturation colors. So the mantis shrimp would get a two, two choice test between um, say a low saturation orange and low saturation blue, but they, they had no preference. Um, I also did a high versus low saturation within each color group. And the mantis shrimp did prefer the uh, high, uh, low saturation to the high saturation in blue only. Uh, these were not significant, these other choices. And um, I finally did a uh, naive choice test where they were given a high saturation color as well as a distractor gray. And they actually seemed to, they, they, they chose the gray over the color most, uh, 
most of the time. Um, this was significant if you add them all up, which was which was quite surprising because um, in other naive choice tests that have a color versus gray, animals tend to choose the color. But going back to the main question, how do mantis chimps interpret color vision? Well, <laughs> we still are not entirely sure. It's probably a mixture of the two major hypotheses: the opponency, um, like within within each row, these uh, either di uh, yeah, dichromatic or trichromatic opponencies, um, and maybe partially with the this barcoding or um, pattern of photoreceptor activation, except that also doesn't account for the results that we got. So the the actual method of color discrimination uh, is likely a mixture or something completely different. Um, and I do want to mention we did find uh, similar results in another uh, gonadactyloid, uh, gonadactylus smithii, but we have not done any of these tests on any other type of mantis shrimp, which could be completely different. Um, quite a few people to thank, uh, especially my advisor, Justin Marshall, as well as the rest of the Marshall group, um, especially the pod group, uh, Judy, who you heard from earlier today, as well as um, Haley England, who did help with quite a few of these experiments as well as uh, Professor Karen Cheney, who helped with some of the statistical analyses. And I would like to thank the Living Light organizers. And I do want to make a completely shameless plug. I am looking for a postdoc position. And um, I also, a major portion of my thesis was neuroanatomy. So if anyone knows of anything or is looking to uh, have a postdoc join, then um, please let me know. Um, and Thank you yeah. very. Sorry. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, we actually have to move on to the next talk.